We're six people away. All right, we're at quorum. Thanks. All right, let's start the meeting. So welcome everybody to the June <clears throat> land use meeting of Community Board 8. Before we start, I just want to mention that we have a very exciting art show this weekend. Um, this is an initiative of the Community Board 8 Arts Committee called City Canvas. Uh, it's an art show that's gonna be on Saturday and Sunday and uh, our former board chair and uh, Arts Committee Chair Alita Camp has uh, taken the lead on organizing this. Uh, so Saturday and Sunday uh, at James Cagney Place, 91st Street between 2nd and 3rd, from 12 p.m. to 6 p.m. we're going to have art on display from local artists. There will be music from local musicians and uh, it's going to be a really nice event, a great way for folks to celebrate the opening of the city as things are coming back and people are getting out uh, in the wake of the pandemic. For board members, we still need volunteers to help with setting up and taking down um, in preparation uh, for that event. <clears throat> so if you're able to assist, please do get in touch with Alita and Max um, and, and uh, coordinate with them. We need help with setting up. So, you know, for folks to get there before 12 to help uh, set everything up so it'll be ready at 12. And then also with taking stuff down uh, at the end of uh, the show each day at six. So uh, please do volunteer if you're able to for Saturday and or Sunday. So with that, let's go to the first item on the agenda, which is a continued discussion of zoning for accessibility which we had a presentation on at the full board meeting last month. So we saw the presentation on it. We had time for some discussion, which was mainly focused on questions for the presenters. And we're very fortunate to be joined um, again by DCP and MTA. So uh, Tony Lashuga and Scott Williamson from DCP are here. Rachel Cohen from MTA is here. So if folks have additional questions about that, um, there's an opportunity for us to get answers about uh, whatever answers to whatever questions we have. And we can also now further discuss the proposal and, and uh, decide what we think about it. So Tony and uh, Rachel, you should be able to unmute. Um if there's any updates or anything you wanted to convey since the public hearing. Yes, yeah. yeah. Okay, thanks, Will. Um, so I, I don't know that we have any updates uh, specifically. We did receive uh, a handful of questions uh, that were funneled to us through Will and then uh, got those back to folks um, who had asked them. So you know, even if you don't get a chance to ask your question tonight, feel free to, to continue to reach out to us and we'll try to get answers back to you as quickly as possible. And this is this is Rachel from the MTA. I would just echo that you know we're we're here tonight um, to answer questions and and continue to follow up as needed. Sure. Okay. Um, any hands from board members? Any uh, Craig later.
Hi, good evening. Um, I had put sent some questions, but I'm not sure. Um, I didn't see a response, so I'm not sure if they were sent over. So if you don't mind, um, let me ask them. So these may sound familiar to you. Um, the first question that I had was, would there be consideration to allow community boards to prioritize improvements within their district for developments opting to participate in the bonus program? Yeah, thanks, Craig. So your questions were actually, I think, the ones that we did receive uh, okay. and, and had sent responses to. Um, but we can, I, I can respond to those now as well, just for the benefit of everyone who's in the meeting. Um, so great, thank you. <laughs> so, um, so the MTA's current capital plan was put together with uh, community consultation, and so that will continue moving forward. Um, as the MTA continues to, to consider what improvements they want to include in their capital budget. And, and while not everything ends up in the capital budget, that's a great opportunity for community boards to voice uh, particular concerns or questions about improvements they would want to see. Um, in terms of this program, uh, you know, the, the, the idea is that uh, particular improvements will come up as uh, proposed by particular developments. And through that process, uh, as an authorization, uh, it will get referred to the community board and that's where the community board can have a lot of um, discretion and weighing in on what improvements are actually needed at the station that that site is uh, uh, nearby, nearby to um, and whether or not those are you know, enough of an improvement or, or not enough or, or if they're not quite the improvement that the community feels that station needs. Um, so that's sort of the level of involvement that the community has in determining what those improvements will be. Um, unfortunately, there's not a process beforehand for the community board to say, you know, at this particular station, we want X, Y, and Z as the only beneficial improvements provided to that site. And some of that is based on the idea that many of these stations have unique underground conditions, unique site conditions that sort of preclude uh, what might seem like obvious improvements. Um, so some stations that seem like, oh, of course it should have an elevator. Um, you know, the siting of elevators can be extremely difficult in Manhattan uh, due to underground conditions. Um, and so while it is helpful for the community to constantly be weighing in on what those improvements would be, um, you know, sometimes we, we ultimately need like MTA's engineering expertise to determine what are feasible improvements on a site by site, you know, basis. So. Okay. Um, and then I had asked if a developer were to offer um, to partially improve a station, would there be a mechanism for it to only proceed once either the MTA or another developer would fund the remaining portion of the ADA project? So I'm thinking of this essentially um, avoiding a situation like we have at 86 and Lex right now, where we have only one of four platforms that have access accessibility at this point. Hmm. So. Uh, what, what would be allowed is for a developer to propose um, an, uh, you know, one particular elevator that is maybe like, you know, uh, street level to mezzanine uh, at a station where maybe the mezzanine is separate from the, from the platform. And so that would be, you know, a, a partial ADA, that, that would be creating a partially ADA accessible station, but not full ADA wow. accessibility. And that would be allowed under this proposal. Um, you know, the, the one thing that the, the developers are not allowed to do uh, would be to say we will provide the funds to create half of an elevator. And then when the MTA capital program gets to it, that elevator will be completed. Um, but yes, there, there is the potential, you know, if, if, the, if the bonus is deemed to be appropriately commensurate with that improvement, that a, a developer could say, we, we would like to build a single elevator that goes from street level to, to the mezzanine or from the mezzanine to the platform, but, but not the others. Um, and we would consider that you know, a, a, a contribution that is worth pursuing uh, if, if, if it's commensurate with the bonus and appropriate for that site. Okay, thank you. Can I just, sorry, add, add on to that? So just, just kind of to add a little color to that response um, with 86th Street as an example, you know, this is also, we see those those improvements, even if they don't make a station fully accessible in one go, as a really important potential step or a really important step on the way to accessibility. So, for example, in our current 2020 to 24 plan, we are planning to complete uh, accessibility at 86th Street on the Lex line. 
as well as at a number of other stations that are currently partially accessible or currently, you know, only have uh, access to the mezzanine and not to all platforms. And those projects, you know, are, are made easier and, and more cost effective and um, more time effective because of the work that's already gone in. So, you know, it, it's a, a completely uh, valid question and you know, we want to be transparent about the answer and what would be allowed. Um, but also put into context that, you know, even, even those improvements that don't sort of complete the work at a station have real value, you know, both in and of themselves and as, as important steps along the way to making those stations and our system fully accessible. So, so just building off of that, and I'm thinking in a more holistic way. So then my other next question was, if ZFA had been in effect when the building on the Northeast corner of 86 and Lex was constructed, would the developer have been at that point in time, if it were in effect now, would the developer have been required to provide an easement on 86th street and avoid the rebuilt station entrance from being built on street as it is now, as opposed to how it was originally in the prior building? And would there be, would there have been any mechanisms for more platforms to have been made accessible in that situation? Yeah, so um, I, I, Rachel, do you feel like you're you're best suited to answer that, or you know? I sure. Can, I mean, I can start. I can start, and then I'm sure you know you decide what I add. I mean, I think the sh the short answer is uh, yes. If zoning for accessibility were in place, you know, we would have had uh, I think more opportunities to you know to talk to and work with the developer, um, and more options. You know, if if they um, we would have been more empowered to to get the developer to provide an easement within the building and you know bring that elevator um, into the building and off the sidewalk as you mentioned um, and the developer could have benefited from the zoning relief measures that you know zfa considers so so would have had you know some incentive to kind of be an active partner in that conversation um and the developer could have chosen to you know pursue the bonus they they obviously wouldn't have been obligated to do so um, but they could have pursued that. And again, there would have been kind of more options on the table uh, for what to do there. All right, that's what my thought. Thank you for that. And then my last question was, um, if you can just explain why there was no affordability language included in the proposed amendment. And was that because possibly there was a concern that developers wouldn't be motivated to participate and affordable units wouldn't yield a significant enough return of investments? Or was there another reason why it wasn't yeah, Part so the broader discussion. Yeah, so so we are, you know, so the bonus floor area would be subject to, uh, would not be subject to inclusionary housing requirements uh, because additional floor area created through the bonus authorization would be earned through, you know, the delivery of a station improvement. So they are delivering something uh, in exchange for that. Subjecting that additional floor area generated from a transit bonus would would limit the use and effectiveness of the transit bonus program through you know the economic purposes that you sort of hinted at. So if a developer were in an area where voluntary inclusionary housing applied, you know they could opt to participate in both programs, um, and the floor area associated with the voluntary inclusionary housing uh, would would be subject to affordability requirements. Um, and same for in mandatory inclusionary housing areas, uh, you know the affordable housing requirements would continue to apply um, to the portion of the development uh, that's not utilizing the transit bonus, uh, but there's no bonus associated with mandatory inclusionary housing. So it was really, you know, what can we do to make this as financially uh, feasible to, to incentivize participation without, you know, uh, d discouraging use of the bonus mechanism. So. All right. All right. I very much appreciate your answers. I want to let other people speak. Thank you very much. Next, let's go to Elaine Walsh. Thank you. Um, I want to give a little background and then ask some questions. I'm sorry, my okay, we'll go for the you mentioned the East 86th Street northeast corner site. When that occurred, the MTA gave away the easement to the developer that required that the access via the subway on 86th Street be inside. There was no trade-off, there was no community input 
we raised serious questions, including why could not the elevator go to the second level, which is the express stop, and make it truly accessible. MTA and CPC did nothing to help our neighborhood. The second piece is on the southeast corner of 86. The developer there was willing, without any bonus, to incorporate an accessible subway within the building with an elevator. But at that point, the developer would be liable for any litigation and total maintenance. And the MTA was not able to open up and look at the importance of accessibility. So I just want to put that out front before I start to ask some serious questions. The proposal before us talks about accessibility, but it's accessibility for the developer to gain a bonus in development. They have changed the regulations from 50 feet from a subway entrance to 500 feet anywhere on the platform or multiple entrances. This is true for Second Avenue, we have multiple. Lexington Avenue, we have multiple. So it would impact any development happening would get the 20% bonus. And my reading of what was sent to us does not include community input. On top of that, you would see developers who wanted to go to Park Avenue on the west side would be in 50 feet and on 86th Street. And while we have for the second Avenue subway, some development, there might be an issue about something else and the developers there could get a bonus. What I don't understand is why is Manhattan going to pay the price to developers who should be doing this, as I call, as of right, they should be improving our infrastructure. But why is Manhattan going to foot the bill here and give a 20% bonus when the other boroughs, the MTA is going to pay for all the ADA? I find this discriminatory. And not having affordable housing will once again say to the broader community and the other boroughs and elected officials, the Upper East Side is racist because we don't have affordable housing. Now, many of you know, I see affordable housing as an economic tool, not a diversity tool. But at the same point, we have been confronted with this. So I really don't understand what you're putting forward to us because the community will gain nothing, nothing. And your commissioner at CPC will have a new title. I can't remember exactly the words because I looked at this a bit ago, but she would be, or he would be, maybe a hopefully a she, if competent, would be the one who would rule on giving the bonus. There is nothing in what I read that talks about community input. I find this entire piece insulting. You've come to us last minute. You talked about the community was involved. We were not involved until you came the other month to present this. So I'm going to oppose this on the grounds of discrimination and an overreach on our community and other communities in Manhattan, putting the bill for the MTA, whose staff and execs receive very high salaries. But gee, it's okay for the other four boroughs not to put the bill. How much and how often do we continue to foot the bill and then be criticized? So I am totally opposed to what you put before. And I think how you've done it is unprofessional and a disrespect to the local community. Okay. All uh, right, let's go next to 
Oh, sorry. Do you go ahead? I, I was just going to say, I, I feel like yeah. it's necessary to clarify a couple of things that, that were said by Elaine, uh, because I, th I think that there's some misunderstanding between the, the two portions of this test. So the, there's the transit easement certification, which is just a, a chair certification. And yes, that has that has no community board uh, review. It's a certification uh, just like all others. So that would be something that would be certified jointly by the MTA and the chair of the city planning commission. But the transit bonus, uh, that is not something that the chair signs off on independent of anything, anybody else. That is an authorization um, and through authorizations, um, that would be something that goes through the CPC is then referred to the community board who does weigh in and uh, can provide feedback and then goes back to the CPC. So there is no mechanism by which the chair of the city planning commission is giving away bonuses without input from any other person. Um, I also wanna clarify that uh, the 20% the bonus is, is the maximum a development can get. It is not a guarantee that a development gets that, that the it could be anywhere from, you know, 0.1% to 20%. And that is dependent on discussions about uh, what is the, you know, uh, whether it is commensurate with what they're providing. Um, the other part is uh, the MTA paying for ADA accessibility and this only being applicable to Manhattan. And I'm not sure where, where that thought is coming from. The ZFA is applicable to all five boroughs. All 59 community boards are weighing in on this. Um, if you look at the maps, it covers every single borough, um, which is why it's referred to all 59 community boards, borough boards, and, uh, and borough presidents. Um, so the idea is that this would be distributed across all of the boroughs so that, uh, you know, there is some equitable distribution based on, you know, where development is already occurring. So. Thank you. All right, next let's go to a uh, member of the public, Donna Messenger. And just so folks know, for members of the public, you know, we have a, a two minute time limit, um, but we'll, we'll unmute Donna. Thank you. Um, for whoever opposed this and said that it was discriminatory, I'll tell you what's discriminatory. I'm an Upper East Sider in a wheelchair and you follow me around from subway to subway. See how many elevators there are that I can get in that I could use the subway just like the rest of you. It's not just for me in a wheelchair. It's for people that are aging. It's an aging society. It's for people with strollers. You may break your leg. There are many reasons why the, the excuse me, why you should be in favor of this. This should be an accessible city. There's no reason to oppose it. And again, like I said, just follow me around, follow anyone else around that needs an elevator, that can't get an elevator, that has to figure out 500 different backup routes. And you tell me that you're still going to oppose it. There is absolutely no reason that you should not be in favor of this. This is a reason to get more of the subways accessible. Thank you. All right, next let's go to Sherry Wiener from the board. Sherry, you just ignore the countdown timer. Okay. Uh, in, in the project brief, it does talk about um, an authorization for transit improvement bonuses in high density areas to facilitate the implementation of the ADA access. I'm trying to get a better handle on, in practical terms, what they mean. I know we've been talking about 20, up to 20%, but what does that mean as far as increased development, the size of the development. Can you give me an example of how, how this would result in, in additional um, buildings or the size of the buildings or just some way to get a handle on what you, the 20% would, would represent is what I'm trying to clarify. Yeah, so, so that's a, a reasonable and good question um, because the, you know, some questions that have come up previously are, you know, why is a percentage not tied to a specific improvement? And, and part of that is that, you know, 20% can vary depending on the, the, the lot size. It can vary depending on the building size. You know, there's very, very big difference between a 20% bonus to a, you know, a, a 10,000 square foot lot versus a, you know, 
60,000 square foot lot. Um, and so one of the things that I think is important in thinking about this, the applicability of this for CB8 is looking at, um, you know, where development already exists that is sort of, you know, maxed out the site um, in terms of floor area and where you think development might occur. Um, you know, where, where, where are those sites that are, are actually considered you know, what we would call soft sites, um, sites that are developable. And, you know, are they big enough to even take advantage of a 20% bonus? Um, you know, because they would, they would, you know, depending on the size of the, the lot, that, that just might not be feasible. Um, so it's, it's kind of hard to give a, a concrete example of, of a specific site in the Upper East Side. Um, but I think it is worth considering that, you know, while the maps show like large swaths of area that this would be applicable to, the existing ground conditions on a lot of those areas are, you know, buildings that are already, you know, fully built out um, or are modern builds um, or that just don't have any more floor area uh, to give uh, because they're, they're part of a different zoning lot or something like that. So, um, you know, the idea of a 20% bonus, it's, it's hard to say like what exactly would get a 20% bonus. It really depends on what the size of that site is, um, you know, and what they're capable of building. So just to follow up, so with the Upper East Side, you keep on talking about lots. I mean, we don't really have any, many building lots. So, so if you're talking, so you're talking about an existing building that you want to put, let's say an elevator, and then they, and if they put the elevator in, they get this up to 20% bonus. What do they do with it if the building is already constructed? Oh, so, so that wouldn't be a, applicable in this. So the bonus is for, you know, new construction um, that would occur there. We're, we're not going to see a, an existing building say we would like to put in a, a new elevator and then, you know, build, you know, a 20% bonus on top of our existing structure. That, that, that wouldn't be likely to be something that would generate a bonus in our eyes because a lot of what we're trying to do um, is, is facilitate these uh, based on new construction. So. And this would only be at, at existing subway entrances? Yeah, it would be it would be at existing subway entrances. Um, so have of course, the, the elevators could be placed uh, as new elevators um, if the MTA determines that there's a good place for a new elevator um, where one doesn't exist already, and so that would potentially facilitate a new entrance uh, in the form of an elevator. And have you done a survey of how many potential locations this program could be implemented in? Um, the department did not do uh, a soft site analysis that would uh, have required looking at the, the totality of the entire city um, because it covers so much, so much area. Um, you know, the, the distances we considered um, were based on what we thought would uh, capture enough uh, potential new development to make this worthwhile um, so that it wasn't just us passing a, you know, a text amendment that isn't going to produce any results. So in your mind, do you think that this would have a large impact on the community eight Upper East Side neighborhood, taking into account all the things you just set forth? I, I'm, I don't, not sure that there will be that, that many locations or any locations where this could be implemented. Am I incorrect or? Um. I, I mean, it's it's really tough to say. I, I would have to, you know, there's there are definitely sites out there that we could assume that new development is going to occur in the Upper East Side. Um, you know, new development is constantly occurring, and so we can say, you know, based on based on the idea that that uh, new development is happening, we we foresee potential, especially for the easement. Um, uh, portion of this to be to be very applicable at new sites. In terms of sites that are actually going to be trying to to achieve the twenty percent bonus, I would say that there you know there is potential for implementation of this across across the district. Is it going to be every new development? Absolutely not. Um, you know, part of this is you know because there's so much discretion between DCP and the community board determining if a bonus is applicable to a site you know there's only so many improvements that can be made before sites can no longer take advantage of the bonus and so it's not that every new development can get a 20 percent bonus like you know if one building gets a 20 percent bonus and a station becomes fully ADA accessible through that then that might be the last bonus that's offered at that station um, all right one one last question so what does say if a developer 
owns the building that's at a subway entrance and they they will put it let's say an elevator in can they take that 20 percent bonus and use it at another building no they cannot no the, okay. the bonuses are tied to a very specific development and a very specific station at a you know, a, a determined percentage value that is commensurate with the improvement they're providing. So I would even say it's probably not as likely that you'll see a full 20% bonus because that means that a development is sort of like maximizing the, the improvements that we would want from them on a particular site. And, you know, the cost of some of these improvements is, is pretty steep. Putting an elevator in Manhattan is, is very expensive. And so, you know, we'll see how that uh, how that plays out, but the, you know, it's, it's anywhere from zero to 20, so. All right, I have a few questions here before we go on to the next um, folks who have their hands up. So the first is, as I understand it, the easement requirement only applies to certain zoning districts. Is there a reason why it doesn't apply to all zoning districts throughout the city, why you've narrowed it to a subset? Yeah, so easements were, it, it covers a, 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 the vast majority of the city. Um, you know, it is relegated to certain districts where we felt like um, it would be appropriate to have, uh, an, an, an easement wouldn't put such an undue burden on potential development that somebody wouldn't be able to sort of maximize their site. You know, there are some uh, station entrances that are adjacent to very low residential districts where putting an easement on uh, you know, a property that has very low floor area um, might not be appropriate um, with that type of, uh, of, uh, of zoning district. Uh, and part of the easements, uh, part of our, our zoning text is also the zoning relief that's provided to sites. Um, so, you know, the up to, up to 10 feet of additional height for putting in a, an easement, some of the, you know, streetscape things that we're, we're willing to overlook. Um, and the, it, we just had a hard time matching the appropriateness of what we're expecting from easements with you know most of the the lower density residential areas of the city it just became hard to, to just to add to that, i mean i think practically it's it's about 95 percent of state of uh subway stations right are, are within the expanded easement territory so i think there's pretty good overlap right between those districts where the zoning districts where this is appropriate and the zoning districts where they're, you know, where there is subway based transit. So there's just like, I think a logical nexus there. Okay. Uh, another question. So the second Avenue subway in our community district is accessible. And so my question is for a subway for subway stations like that, or subway line like that, is it still possible to, um, is there still essentially eligibility for the, um, for the bonus, even where, you know, there's questions about whether it would be necessary in light of the existing accessibility. So, I, I, you know, we included it in our maps of, of areas because there is an existing subway line because the zoning is appropriate in that area, but you're absolutely right. It, it will be much more difficult for developers to obtain a bonus on those stations that are already accessible. Um, the one exception to that might be um, if the, the MTA, uh, determines that creating even more redundancy to the accessibility um, is beneficial to the community, um, then, you know, a developer could potentially receive a bonus in exchange for creating a necessary redundancy. So, you know, a second or third elevator or, you know, a, a new set of stairs uh, in an area where they're, where they would be beneficial. So that would be sort of the only example where I would see the, the second Avenue subway benefiting from this. Okay. Is it possible to get the FAR bonus for improvements to subway stations that don't actually increase accessibility? Hmm. Um, so no, the, the entire purpose of this text is that these should be increasing accessibility, um, whether that's stairs, escalators, elevators, um, you know, wider, wider pathways, um, things like that. Um, are, are, well, are you, I guess... Okay, when I say accessibility, I mean accessibility for, you know, people with disabilities who can't use stairs, for example. So is it possible, is there any circumstance in which you could have an improvement to a station such as, you know, making it more spacious or something along those lines, but the actual uh, accessibility for people in wheelchairs, for example, isn't, isn't improved and the bonus would still be available? 
So um, for any station that doesn't have full ADA accessibility, the first improvements that we would require um, from a developer would be full ADA accessibility. So if that station is not fully accessible to a person in a wheelchair, then no. Those other options of you know, widening a stairway or widening a passageway, those are, those are not available to a developer until that station is fully ADA accessible. Okay, but if it is ADA accessible, then you could make additional improvements to it that wouldn't relate to uh, accessibility. Uh, they, they would relate to the to pedestrian circulation is really what it comes down to, yeah. Right, okay. like it's not, it's not for like aesthetic improvement, you know, yeah. and arts and design and things of that nature, right? It's, it's as Tony said, sort of accessibility, like broadly defined. Um, and, and from our perspective, I work with this wide accessibility group at Transit um, and, and we completely support, you know, the uh, approach here where elevators and ADA accessibility are, you know, the first priority improvement. Um, but if a station is already fully accessible, you know, things like new stairways, widened stairways, you know, stairways that have kind of the, the latest, uh, you know, handrails and treads and risers, like those are accessibility improvements and, you know, in the broader scheme. Um, so we are, we're kind of thinking of it in that like prioritized way, but with, you know, with definite parameters right around what would be eligible for a bonus. Okay. And then last question here. So, and this, I think is a, I think you answered this already, but for under this proposal, any time that the bonus would apply or that a bonus would be sought, would the community board have some sort of review of that? Yeah, so the, the, the process for getting the bonus is an authorization, which um, requires community board review. So yeah, it would go to the CPC, it would get referred to the community board where um, you could weigh in um, and then it would get sent back to the CPC. Okay, all right, thank you. Uh, let's go next to Barbara Rutter. You're unmuted, Barbara, just hit, hit it once. There you okay. go. Yes, Great, yeah. thanks. I have maybe a naive question. Listening to either de Blasio you know, um, uh, television discussion or somebody else, the discussion was to add to ADA, I'm not saying instead of um, elevators, ramps. Um, I'm hearing you talk about stairs, which is the first time I heard you talk about stairs uh, as um, ADA. Ramps have a lot of advantages. They're cheap. Some of the elevators worry me when you're talking about um, giving bonuses to halfway and hopefully it will be further developed at another time is not making it ADA accessible. What do you think of ramps? Is that something that's plausible and, and can be used? They don't break. They're safer. They're... Yeah. I think that's a good question for for, uh, for Rachel to answer. Yeah, so so uh, we should we should be more clear. Uh, making a station vertically accessible through a ramp would qualify under zoning for accessibility. But as a pra and we you know from the MTA side fully agree with your assessment. Right, ramps never break. They're easy to maintain. Uh, you know they're they're cheaper. Customers love them. Um, customers like me who you know have kids in strollers love them. Um, but as a practical matter, citing a ramp, especially in a you know, place like the Upper East Side, the horizontal you know, space and distance required to ramp into a station is often prohibitive. So when we're looking at you know, conceptual station design, we do consider ramps and we would consider um, a ramp as like an acceptable improvement here. But as a, as, you know, just as a practical matter, we're kind of using elevator as, as like a proxy, you know, stand in for vertical accessibility because it's most often what is uh, feasible. Good, thank you. Yeah. And I should say, we're about to open a ramp on uh, Avenue H, a station on the Brighton line in Brooklyn, which is accessible in one direction, we're getting the other direction. So there are about a dozen stations in the system accessible by ramp, uh, but it's it's unfortunately the exception, not the rule. A ramp takes much more room than very steep stairs, such as at Second Avenue. They take much more room than that, okay. Yeah, I, I, I don't want to comment on specifically, you know, Second Avenue and station well, by station, but, but generally, yeah, to, to meet the, you know, slope uh, requirements of, of the ADA, right, to have a safe ramp, you just need a very long run. Okay. Yeah. All right, let's go to Lori Boris, please. Hello. 
Um, I have, uh, I think, three questions. Um, first, I want to um, thank you, uh, continue to thank you for doing this. Um, as uh, most of us know, the ADA was passed in 1990. So it's uh, 30 years um, after um, the MTA should have done something about this, but you know, better late than never. Um, and uh, I agree with Donna Messenger, is it, that um, this really has to be taken seriously. And I am certainly going to vote for this. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, the, the first question is, I did ask this last time, and I'm pretty sure that I got the answer, but just to um, repeat the information, um, the MTA is not considering, and you used the word, I think it was redundancy, um, about it, you know having two elevators so that if one breaks down, um, the other one will be available. And I think that I understood you to say that that is not part of the plan right? You're not going to, like for all of the elevators that are going to be built going forward, um, that's not going to be part of it. Is that correct? Um, so uh, I can, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I was going to say, maybe I can comment on like MTA capital projects and, and then kick it over if you want to you know, talk about the context of ZFA. So when we um, plan, <clears throat> excuse me, plan to make a station accessible um, as part of a like freestanding MTA capital project. Uh, we always look at the opportunity for redundant elevators uh, and, you know, obviously on Second Avenue, right, we have some some redundancy um, where it's possible. Uh, but again, you know, it's, it's often just a, a decision, you know, with in a world of limited resources, if you do additional, you know, street elevators or redundant elevators at one station, that's another station that you, you know, can't get to until kind of the, the next round down the line. So it, it kind of depends on the station and the site conditions, uh, but it is not a requirement. Um, it's not, you know, it's not the norm, uh, but but under zoning for accessibility, I, I do think it's possible. And, and yeah, maybe Tony can comment on that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's certainly possible. Um, if, if a developer said the station is already fully ADA accessible, but we could create a second elevator on this site, um, you know, we, we would certainly consider that um, as, as possible. Okay, but if a developer is coming and to do something in the original plan, um, they would still get, you know, the bonus, even if they weren't planning to do two elevators, correct? Yeah, yeah, it's possible All that right. a developer could do one elevator and, and not the redundant second one. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I, I, I think that that's a mistake, but, you know, we'll move on. Um, the next thing is, um, will the, because there are, because the population is aging and because there are so many more people um, who need the accessibility um, and the strollers and the, you know, the other things, you know, um, mothers with children and, you know, um, or, you know, fathers with children for that matter. Um, are the, are the elevators going to be any larger than they, than some of them are, you know, because some of them are really like, you can fit maybe four people, maybe. Um, and that, that to me is, you know, it's kind of a waste of resources in my book, if you, are going to do it from the start, you know, so, so what's the requirement for the size of the elevator? So I think it's kind of similar to redundancy in, in that, you know, we all agree in principle, right, that, that redundant elevators, bigger elevators would, would have the real benefits you describe, and it's a trade-off of, of space in this case, right? I mean, we're often trying to thread the needle to, to get an elevator, you know, around utility lines and sewers and, and other property, but everything has to be code compliant and, and ADA compliant, right? So the base, their basic requirements um, in the building code and, and in the regulations associated with ADA that basically say, you know, you have to be able to, to safely pass through and or turn around, you know, have wheelchair uh, navigating radius within an elevator um, to safely use it. But, you know, there's a, there's a reason that the elevators in our system tend to be relatively small and, you know, we're trying to fit them in small spaces. So. The, the requirement would be that, you know, the elevator has to be to code and to standard. And I think we would look for opportunities, you know, to, to go beyond that. But I don't, I don't think that's something that, you know, we would or could require. Okay. 
also a disappointing answer, but thank you for giving it. <laughs> but uh, I mean, your point is well no, taken, it's okay. but that's, that's, the, Listen, that's the truth. Yeah. Uh, okay. All right. Um, and the last thing, the last thing that I want to say is um, I have managed to navigate my way around mass transit systems in uh, London, in Paris, in uh, China, in Hong Kong. Uh, and I do not speak any of those languages, except for I do speak English. But um, uh, I have gone on this mass subway systems on all of these um, exotic places without speaking the language. And it has never been as much of a problem as I think it is on the uh, New York City, on the MTA subway uh, for someone who doesn't speak the language. And even for someone who does speak the language, myself, you know, I, I never know what, uh, if I'm in a strange um, subway station, like what the mezzanine means, you know, or the upper mezzanine and the lower mezzanine, you know, like I know what it means in a theater. I can tell you what it means if I'm going to see a play, but why can't they, the MTA identify where you're going when you're on the elevator? You know, you should, you could have a, a sticker or something. The signage is terrible. You could have a uh, an indication of like you know the lower mezzanine is going to the A train. You know the upper mezzanine is going to you know whatever. You get my point. Yes. Why is it that we, you know, out out of all the like systems in the world, I think that we are the least understandable. If you especially if you don't speak the language, but even if you do, go ahead. Uh, it's a great question. I, I think a little bit beyond the scope of, of zoning for accessibility. I mean, I will say, you know, we're, we have a lot of uh, related, but, but, you know, separate from this project efforts underway around signage and yeah, elevator, everything from elevator call buttons to, you know, automated announcements. Um, and, and I'm happy to, to talk more about that. Uh, my, you know, maybe that's something that, that we could follow up on, but I, related to zoning for accessibility, I think that, you know, when we look to design elevators in the future, it's important to pay attention to the little things like the language on the elevator call button. So, you know, that that's all points well taken. I, I would say all things that we are working on, we consider. Um, I don't want to use the size of our system as an excuse. It's just a, a challenge and a reality we live with. Um, but I hope, you know, based on how you prefaced your remarks, not not something that, you know, takes away from your support from of the broader goal of, you know, getting more accessibility and yes. elevators. So feedback well taken. That, that, that's absolutely correct. And thank you very much for coming here and talking to us about this. Thank you. Thank you. Next, let's go to Michelle Birnbaum. Yes, thank you, Russell. Um, let me just say that I don't want anybody on this call in this meeting to assume anything negative from the questions that are being asked. Um, Everybody is for accessibility. I certainly am. I am in need of it myself, but even if I weren't, I'm for it. I'm sure everybody is. But the devil is very often in the details, and I think it's really commendable that everybody's asking their questions and that we're getting into the details. So don't misconstrue that. Um, a couple of questions. First of all, how does this text amendment, you say it improves the relationship between the uh, developer and the community, uh, you're able to offer the developer something, you're able to negotiate, you're able to talk. What exactly in the wording of this text amendment improves that compared to the wording in the prior text amendment? How and why was that not possible prior to this? Um. I'm, I'm not sure I, I entirely follow the, the distinction between the prior text and the current text. What can you can you explain what you mean? By well, well is the this new text, text, text proposal? or is this replacing text? Oh, so th Sorry. This, is, this is brand new text. Yeah. It's so not there replaced. was no wording in the original, but there was no wording not allowing a developer and the MTA to talk to each other, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, developers have always been encouraged. So that was always a possibility that they could commiserate and they could come to some kind of an agreement. The difference here is the bonus. Um, and you talk about what happens to this 
up to 20% bonus, which most developers will take in height. What happens to that in, in, on avenues that have no height limits? For example, what are you offering on first, second, and third avenue, for example? You're to offer a developer a 20% uh, bonus, which I imagine would mean an increase in height of the building in an area where there is no height limit. How is that? Are there other benefits that you offer in place of that? Or is that pretty much it? Or explain that if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, so, so the transit bonus is, uh, is you know, tied to floor area that the, the developer can use, which does, you know, often translate into, or, or translates into additional height. Um, the thing to consider is, you know, what does, what does the site look like? Um, what does 20% look like on any given site? Um, you know, if you're talking about a, a single lot that is, you know, a, a three or four story tenement, 20% um, of whatever development can be built on that one particular lot is going to be significantly smaller than, um, you know, if, if somebody bought up uh, an entire block frontage and, and had that as their entire mm. zone lot. So 20% really varies depending on, or, or the, the height correlated with 20% really varies depending on the, the size of the development site itself. So so with my under, I understand what happens, what, what is a bonus that you are able to give to a developer who is building on, on, a, on a lot that has no height restriction? Uh, I mean, it would be, you know, whatever their development uh, potential is on that site, um, up and then up to 20%. More. Well, it could be 50, they could be, they could be building 500 feet, they can be building 700 feet, they can be built, building 1000 feet, when there's no height limit, there's no height limit. Uh, yes, when there's no height limit, there's no height limit, that, that is a truth, but um, so the, the height is the dependent point is, there's on no the, other, when you but there's still floor area ratio. I mean, there's still FAR. Every every zoning district has some FAR. Yeah. So uh, associated. you know, yeah, the, that's that's what it is. So the the twenty percent is is tied to whatever the FAR is that they are allowed to build on that particular site. Okay. Um, so it, it really varies. All right. The size. My other. All right, I get that. Also, by the way, I don't know if you realize it, but to my, to me, you're fading in and out. So I'm not sure if you can increase your volume and um, the other thing is am I correct it's 500 feet any development within 500 feet of the subway site is that correct that, that is correct am uh, I correct yes except for in the central business districts um, where that is extended to 1500 feet yeah how did you come upon that why 500 feet? Why did you need 500 feet? And how does that play in if you run into a historic district? Yeah, so, so 500 feet was determined um, based on uh, considering like what is, a, what is a, a reasonable distance that from a station that like that new development is close enough to the station that they are directly benefiting from being close to a station. Um, you know, people who work or live in that building are likely to use a station that is within 500 feet. Um, it also creates just like a, a broader net for us to be able to say, you know, within each of these nets, we want to be able to capture, you know, maybe one or two developments that are willing to opt into this bonus and take advantage of it to help provide these, these, these uh, improvements that are desperately needed to the system. And so, you know, anything smaller than- So you're looking from- you're looking for more than one developer. I think you're mute. I'm not hearing you. Am I the only one not hearing you? I can hear. Yeah, I can hear. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. To me, oh, it was mute. I, I couldn't hear him. Uh, so you're, but you're basically counting on or thinking that it would be more than one developer that would have, that you would like to see participate in this. And then if you go down to uh, Midtown, you're talking about 1500 feet. So you can be talking about as many as six developers that you might be wanting to participate in this. Is that a good assessment? Yeah, I mean, wanting is, is maybe the not, maybe not the right term. You know, we're not 
you know, wanting any particular number of developments. Um, you know, it really varies from station to station. There, there are stations within the system that need a significant number of improvements, and that might require, you know, multiple developments opting into the bonus program in order to help us meet all of the needs of that station. Um, but as, you know, Russell pointed out earlier, there, there are stations along the Second Avenue subway in the Upper East Side that, that maybe don't need any further improvements. And so, you know, we're, we, we don't expect any development to be able to take advantage of that bonus. So it's really a, a station by station uh, consideration for how many, you know, how many developments would be necessary to, to maximize station accessibility. My, my last question, what about a historic district? Let's say a historic district, somebody was building um, in a historic district, they were paying attention to the height limitations and whatever and they fell within 500 feet from a subway, what takes precedent, your bonus for the benefit to the subway or the rules and regulations of the historic district? Yeah, it's a good question for its applicability to the Upper East Side, which has numerous historic districts that are within 500 feet of, of subway stations. Um, so uh, a couple of things would, would apply in those situations. Um, one, the, uh, the, the bonus that that development could get through a transit improvement has the potential to uh, supersede the height limit of a historic district. The second part of that, though, is that because they're in historic districts, all of these would have a further uh, review process where they would have to go through LPC. Um, so LPC would have to approve of, of the site saying that it does match the character of the historic district uh, and that the, the, the height that, that would be sought through this bonus is actually appropriate. And so that adds like one other layer, uh, you know, that helps protect the historic district that there is, you know, LPC trying to, uh, LPC reviewing it, CPC reviewing it, and the community board reviewing that to say, you know, is this bonus commensurate with the improvement they're, they're offering? Um, and, and are we okay with that as, as a community? But who has the weight? The community board is advisory. Does LPC have more weight than the, the um, than city planning on something like this? Could their could their no vote actually stop the development? I mean, stop the bonus from applying? Um, it, Where does the weight lie here? It's a it's a good question, and I can I can come back to you to make sure that I give you the most appropriate response. But but typically, if if LPC does not approve of a development. Uh, as matching the historic character, that that's sort of where a project ends. So, you know. Okay, I would appreciate if you have more information on that, I would love to hear it. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you. Next, let's go to Rebecca Lamour. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, so just a few quick questions. I wanna start by thanking Donna for speaking earlier. Um, it also upset me to hear the word discrimination used about this because disabled New Yorkers are being discriminated against every day by the inaccessibility of our system. Um, and I know, like Michelle said, everyone here supports accessibility, but the devil's always in the details. And I do personally feel it's important to support this so we can get these accessibility updates. The city's tried so long, like Lori said, the ADA is 30 years old going to be turning 31 this year. It's older than I am and we're still fighting to implement. So I am fully supportive of this. I do have some questions though. And I will say I was alarmed to hear earlier when the MTA said they view partial accessibility updates as a part of this and an okay thing to do. Um, I can say as someone that isn't always able to do stairs, sometimes my mobility allows me to, sometimes I can't and I cannot then take the subway when I get to a partially accessible station. It's really difficult and I can't imagine what it's like for a wheelchair user to be faced by that. So I understand your priority is getting these updates done, but partial accessibility is not accessibility. And I would really like you to go back to the drawing board on that and find a better solution instead of incrementally updating stations. Um, because my concern is the timeline then. If we start with partial accessibility now and then we're waiting on another developer to come and apply for it and do the next round of updates, it could still be years that communities are facing partial accessibility, which again is no accessibility. So I really want to add that. Um, also, when it comes to ramps, a lot of times not all ramps are ADA accessible. Sometimes they're marked and you'll see that. So 
elevators and escalators are the best ways for vertical accessibility. Um, so ramps may work in some outer boroughs, but here in Manhattan, where we're going deep underground, I would like to see us do elevators instead of ramps. Um, I do have a few specific questions though about the upkeep of elevators. Very often when we have private developers pay for accessibility updates, then the MTA is liable or the developer's liable, or we don't know who, and it falls in a gray area where then elevators aren't working for a very long time. So what's your plan on that front? Who is control around the operations, the upkeep, the maintenance, and how regularly will that happen? Sure, so so thank you for the feedback. I, I appreciate it. And I think, you know, we we really share the goal of, of full accessibility, but you're, you know, I, I understand uh, the the feedback on partial access, partially accessible stations. In terms of maintenance, um, the, this is spelled out in the proposal and it depends on the specific location of the elevator and how it's built. So anything built under the easement um, would be an MTA owned and operated and maintained elevator. So we're getting the space you know, within the developer building, but then the MTA is doing the work of the capital project, you know, constructing the elevator and, and it's sort of ours um, going forward. If it is a elevator built under the bonus uh, by a developer, it would be, um, if it's fully within the developer's building, it would be a third party elevator, you know, it makes sense, right? If it's kind of on their property, on their site, that uh, the developer is responsible for the maintenance, but we have a maintenance agreement in place. And that's something that we've evolved over time. You know, we've gotten better and better, more stringent agreements to, to the points that you've raised where they have, you know, reliability standards and, and mechanisms in place to enforce that. If the elevator is located within a station envelope um, or on the sidewalk, it would actually get, um, the developer would turn it over to the MTA to maintain, but kind of with uh, support, financial support for the maintenance going forward. So the developer is, you know, responsible for uh, the construction and, and financing effectively, and the elevator would be managed by the MTA if it's, you know, not within the footprint of the building. And if it's in the footprint of the building, what's the accountability then for timeliness of updates? What in the contract, what, what is that outline? So there uh, it has a performance standard basically that has to be commensurate with whatever the MTA standard is for our own machines at the time. So it's currently 96.5% uh, availability and rely, uh, reliability for customers. And we, the MTA has to be a third party beneficiary on their maintenance agreement, which basically empowers us. You know, if the developer is not holding up their end of the bargain, we can call their call Schindler and say, hey, you got to go out and fix that machine. And the, the bill goes to the developer, you know, they're, they're financially responsible. So that's a pretty key provision. Um, and then they're required to put up letters of credit for both operating and eventual capital replacement for the elevator. So there's, you know, financial um, skin in the game on, an, on a long-term ongoing basis as well. And then for prioritizing what gets updated, what goes first when we do all of this, because um, we have the Q train here in the neighborhood, which is accessible, and I'm really glad we have it. But the Lexington Avenue line is fully inaccessible. And I say that with the partial accessibility at 86th Street, because partial accessibility is still inaccessibility to me, just as a disabled New Yorker, I'm sorry. Um, so what, how do we prioritize stations? Are we looking at ridership? Are we looking at surrounding population? How are we prioritizing that? And also, especially for the outer boroughs, you know, I, I want to see accessibility here in our community first and foremost, obviously. Um, but so many outer borough communities, there are multiple flights of stairs to get up to the trestle or down below. And it really harms so many New Yorkers. And we may live in this community, but after COVID, we'll all be traveling around again, hopefully soon, fingers crossed. Um, and we'll be taking the subway to other parts of the community the city and the community that are inaccessible. So how are we prioritizing what happens and when? So for the MTA's capital capital program as a whole, uh, the secondary <laughs> stations that are named in the current capital plan were prioritized on, on a number of different factors, uh, but, but geographic equity was actually kind of the, the overall framework and, and the first and foremost factor. So we looked at a framework where we wanted to ensure that after this completion of this capital plan, Riders across the system would never be more than two stops away from an accessible station. So, you know, citywide coverage, geographic equity is, is the framework for the 70 stations that we prioritize for this plan. Within that framework, we looked at ridership, demographics, you know, a lot of, of community input drivers. We, we heard from a lot of communities in the outer boroughs, like, you know, we, we really want this station because it has these bus connections or is closer to this school. Like, we took all of those uh, factors into account on a community by community, line by line basis. So that's how we got to the, the 70 stations that we're planning to do in this capital plan. And when it comes time for you know planning for the next capital plan, 25 to 29, 
we'll be looking to kind of fill in those remaining gaps, but I think also continuing to hear from communities across the city about, you know, what their priorities are. Um, so it's no, you know, it's not one single factor, but but citywide coverage and geographic equity is really kind of a, a controlling framework for the work that we're doing right now. So then also to confirm zoning for accessibility is just about the 70 stations already pinpointed in the capital plan. It's not no, about the no, entire I'm sorry, I'm, I'm talking, uh, that not at all, and, and let me clarify. So I was talking specifically about the MTA's named capital investments and where we're prioritizing. Zoning for accessibility um, has the potential to, to benefit a wide range of stations across the city. Almost every station could benefit from the easement provision um, and the bonus provision is expanded to cover, you know, most of Manhattan, downtown Brooklyn, Long Island City, Jamaica and parts of the South Bronx. So those are all the areas where the bonus could apply. So, you know, look, if we get, you know, a lot of stations done through zoning for accessibility, then we can kind of continue working our way down, down the list faster and faster. And that's really, I think, part of why this proposal is so exciting for us. You know, it's, we, we know what our long-term goal is and, and every tool that we can use to get there faster, we see as a, you know, opportunity worth pursuing. And then to also just drill down on the kinds of accessibility, because earlier you said that increased pedestrian access is also viewed as accessibility through this plan. The priority would be elevators and escalators. Um, but I would like to hear more from you, elevators, escalators, but then what other forms of accessibility come before we get to pedestrian paths and staircases, like textured paths, more audible announcements, things for blind and low vision New Yorkers, deaf New Yorkers, or that is that gonna be prioritized in our stations and public transit before we do updates to stairs and other forms of access? So zoning for accessibility is, is really focused on vertical access. Um, the, the kinds of improvements that are, you know, commensurate with the developer bonus are, are really for the big ticket items, you know, for the elevators, for the new entrances. Um, we're doing a, a tremendous amount of work around announcements, you know, tactile warnings um, and, and tactile guideways. We piloted a lot of stuff at, at the J Street station in Brooklyn, which we can share more information about. So. When we say a station is ADA accessible, our definition includes all of those pieces, uh, but, but zoning for accessibility you know, is kind of a, a slice within that. That's really about how do we get the private developer community to engage with us on the piece where they can be most helpful, which is you know, connecting from the street to the station inside or in front of their building. I do also want to echo what Lori said. I do believe it would be more beneficial to have multiple elevators. So after a station is fully accessible, instead of then pivoting to do stairways and walkways for people that can do those kinds of mobility, um, I think it would be more beneficial for the city, for the community to have second elevators put in. Very often as a disabled New Yorker, you're either waiting a long time for an elevator, it, then if an elevator is out of service, you're getting back on the train to go to the next station if you're unable to do the stairs. Um, so I, I would like to see priority given there to ensure that there's constant accessibility. I do respect the 96.4% performance rate that you want for elevators, but just too often in the system as I'm sure you unfortunately hear complaints about a lot that the elevators, just, they're not working and there's no good way for public education on it. So if there's any way I know through zoning for accessibility, this isn't a part of zoning, but something the MTA can do with more alerts about when elevators are down because online that's not outlined. You know, you can plan a trip that's accessible, but then you get there and the elevator's down and you're just, you're out of luck. You're back to the drawing board trying to figure out how you go about your day as a disabled New Yorker. So that's something I would really like to see improved as well as we increase access, because I think it's important to have both. We need to increase access, mm -hmm. but then also increase transparency and accountability. So people know if they can actually go to that station and it is accessible that day. Yes, sorry, I'm, I'm taking notes. I, get, I understand. Yeah. I also just want to reiterate my full support for this plan. You know, the state has tried at accessibility, the city has, and it just, it never happens. And it really harms so many people. And as Donna said earlier, accessibility helps everyone. It's not just about people with disabilities, wheelchair users. If you're a parent with a stroller, if you're getting out to JFK airport with a big bag, think about taking an elevator. 
or an escalator instead of going up and down those stairs, if you have a broken leg for six weeks, you know, so I would implore all of my fellow board members to ask your questions, have your concerns, raise your issues, but think about what it would be like if it was you seeing that flight of stairs and knowing you just couldn't go about your day and you, you couldn't get to where you needed to go in the city of New York that so many people take for granted. So thank you for doing this. I really appreciate you coming and taking our questions and feedback. Thank you. Thanks. Let's go next to Anthony Cohn. Hi, uh, thank you, Russell. And thank you, Rebecca, for highlighting the breadth of the accessibility challenge, that it's not just vertical accessibility, it's all of those other issues having to do with announcements and tactile surfaces and everything else. Um, but I have a lot of very serious concerns, not about the, um, the, the first piece of this program, um, which is the sort of within 50 feet of the station and whatever, um, whatever uh, um, uh, accommodations that involves. I have a lot of concern about the other part, about the bonuses, and not even so much about the um, floor area bonus, which is not uncommon, but about the effects of the 25% height and how that will be allowed to um, supersede any height limits that already exist. And I, I, I understand, and, and if we look at just community board A, and, and I, I, I confess, I don't know very much, I don't know a whole lot about us, but I know a lot less about other uh, parts of the city. Um, we have sites at 86th and 1st, which are developable. Um, and the larger those sites, become through all sorts of um, uh, floor area uh, zoning uh, transfer, development rights transfers, and also just through um, uh, uh, accumulating large sites, we could in theory end up with really tall buildings. And the problem is that we are then asked to rely upon the um, good judgment, both of the Department of City Planning and the MTA, um, in order to uh, prevent us from ending up with 1,000 foot tall buildings on the Upper East Side. And I'm, that, that's a number I have in fact pulled out of the air. It's not a real number. And so the, and it's not a question, it's a comment. It's that given the way in which government agencies have recently behaved toward development, it is very difficult for me personally to, frankly, to trust you. That the Landmarks Commission, which you, Tony, said would, well, they would stop any really bad development, any non-inappropriate development um, within a landmark district, Landmarks recently approved the project for the uh, uh, reconstruction of the Hotel Commodore and the um, uh, 42nd and um, 42nd and Lexington. And in, in my view, there is no sane world in which landmarks would think, could think that that's okay. It's not okay. And the danger is that what happens since we as the community board are the least, our opinion is the least valuable in these conversations and the least binding is that we are then reliant on the continued goodwill, not just now, but forever of the Department of City Planning Landmarks Preservation Commission and the MTA. We can jump up and down and wave our arms and scream that this 1,000 foot tower at the corner of 86th and 1st is a bad idea, but a future Department of City Planning may say, good idea. We need more luxury apartments, 25% higher, 20% more floor area, and no, none of that affordable. It doesn't make it, it, you're asking us 
to, you're asking us to make a decision to possibly do some good that will also do some permanent harm. And so this uh, opposition to this is not opposition to accessibility. Opposition to this is not opposition to the MTA's um, uh, capital plan. The question really is, why are we, the city of New York, and this is a question I don't expect an answer to, why are we not insisting that new developments contribute to accessibility of subway stations within 500 feet? If it reduces ever so slightly the monstrous profits of the developers, maybe that's just something we should be doing. And as a question, I heard somebody say that there, that, um, uh, that uh, uh, you all hadn't done um, soft side analysis of where these developments might occur. Um, I don't know if that was right or wrong, but I would think that that would have been actually a very appropriate comment. And if I look at the corner of, if I look at the 77th Street Lexington Avenue subway station, which is one of the most shameful in terms of accessibility that I can think of, certainly in our neighborhood, um, the, the, I have to wonder why we didn't look at that, especially with a loop, we being you, um, especially with the, the, a looming uh, development project on the part of um, uh, Northwell Lennox Hill that will double their size and could potentially make a very large tower even larger if they were allowed to further um, uh, expand its height. Anyway, um, I'm just curious about the soft sides. Otherwise that was a comment, not a question. Yeah, I, I do want to just clarify one thing um, in, in your comment, though, the 25% the height increase, um, that is not just like a, a given thing. Um, so the, the trans- oh, Okay, the I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt, but you're right. That's another question. Who decides? Who decides how much of the 20% they get? And who decides how much of the 25% of height the developer gets? Yeah, so, so the, the, the transit bonus itself is the up to 20%, and that's through an authorization. Um, so the authorization f goes to CPC, the community board, then back to the CPC. Uh, the 25% height increase that you're talking about is something that's written into the text to say if sites have e extremely constrained site conditions that they can prove that they need uh, a height increase in order to make their site viable, um, they can seek further actions to ask for up to 25% in a height increase. But that is on top of the authorization. It is a special permit, which means that that goes through the full ULERP process. So that would actually go to CPC, the community board, your council member, um, the, you know, the borough president and the mayor. So we put that in there uh, as an option for sites that are extremely constrained and can prove that they need it but expected that this would have limited applicability uh, because they have to prove that this is a necessary thing. And two, because it's a full ULERP, it, it requires a, a lot of a particular developer financially, time-wise. I'm, 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 sorry. I'm sorry, I don't mean to cut you off, um, but how, who decides? Is it in effect like any ULERP process that it is largely a conversation between you all at city planning and the developer and then it get, gets to us? I mean, it gets, it gets approved through the exact same ULERP process as any other project, if, if that's a road that they wanted to take, but that's an, an extremely, you know, you, you mentioned yourself that it's very speculative. What you described is entirely speculative. So, well, you know, I look, look, I mean, and, and, and then I'll stop, Russell, I promise. Um, I'm an architect. My job is largely speculative. It's to look at a piece of property, 
look at an apartment and speculate as to what might be possible. And then to try and make that possibility happen. So speculative to me is not a sort of vague thing. Speculative to me is the first step to a 1,000 foot tall building at 86th and 1st Avenue. And now I'll stop. Thank you, Russell. Thank you, Tony and, and Rachel. Sure. I just can, um, just to follow up on one of the issues that um, Anthony raised, can you just address the point about, uh, you know, why, why couldn't this just be mandated? I mean, why couldn't there just be essentially a requirement instead of doing it through a sort of incentive or a bonus to FAR? Why couldn't there just be essentially a requirement that for, um, you know, projects within a certain radius of a station are required to incorporate transit accessibility improvements? Yeah, um, you know, often those sorts of like mandatory things require some sort of uh, legislative um, conditions. Um, that they aren't typically things that we can just, that we have a, a mandate to push through um, in terms of zoning. So. All right. Uh, that might be a good question for, for your legislators. Like that, that would be something that they would have to push through. Got it. Okay. Uh, all right, next let's go to Marco. Thank you, Russell. Um, the first question that I would like to ask you what is the DCP definition for full ADA accessibility? Because once we have the definition, we can discuss. We go, otherwise, I find obscure, what are you doing? Sometimes you said, oh, this is not part of the regulation. Can you define that properly? And I think that's the, way, the first thing, the first step that you should do before you start anything in ADA compliance. Can you describe that, please? Well, well, ADA is is, uh, is is based on the the federally mandated definitions of ADA. Correct. That's basically what it said. Uh, I don't know if you can see it. I have the 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 guidance on the 210 ADA the standard for accessibility from the Department of Justice, and uh, according with them, it means they have a definition of the uh, of the ADA compliance, and but. The only thing they say is in general terms, it need to be clarified. And that is raise the issue of, you call, you call redundancy. I call second means of egress because if there is an accident in the train station and everybody escaped and the only exit is broken, that people has to die. And that is my concern. And that is what I'm asking you to have first start with the definition of the of the ADA compliance. If you don't have the definition, how are we gonna proceed forward? Because according with that, you have to make the design. You have to require the designer to provide what you want to do. By the way, I support the accessibility. This is a good intention. I support in that direction, but I think other people that they go against, not because they don't wanna have accessibility to, the, to those places, is because we want to have something that really, really be accessible at any time. Knowing the good times when you have accessibility in and out, we have to talk in the, in the, in the emergency, when we have emergency times in the, in, the, in the subway. And that is my first concern. And that's, I think I find a little bit weak, the definitions. We need to clarify perfectly the definition for all of us. And then many of questions and concerns will be resolved. That is the, my first point. My second point is, you said that you have the, the, the transit easement, no community input, and then you have the transit bonus that they said CPC, community board CPC. And what you provide is 20% max of the area and 25% uh, of the high increase. So the problem is when you leave open like that, I think now it's coming with what our community has, the problems. One of the, the problems I'm gonna raise is the pops. Pops uh, in your system, it, it wasn't clear. And that's will have a nightmare in our community because 
you didn't establish properly equally for all developments. Some developments, they take one to four. That means for every one square foot that provide for uh, open space, they receive four square feet in, in, the, in the development. And I have seen in, in some development, they take 12. That means the question is how the developer is well connected with the system, he can get more. Or how skillful are the consultants so the developer can get more. And you have a big disparity in, 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 the, in the benefits. And you have to establish a rule for everybody. Otherwise, some development is gonna take less and other more. And I think it's completely wrong to do that. And that, that is the concern of the, that Anthony raised is the high of the buildings, especially the high of the buildings. They, if, it's not, if it's not contextual, you know very well they can go higher and higher. And that is coming the other problems that you create, the famous of the mechanicals. You put arbitrary, just went to the department of buildings and find out that the, the regular building, the maximum height of the buildings and mechanical is 25 feet, and you put the rule for everybody, even though that most of them, they don't need it. Because in, in, this is applicable only for residential, and residential usually are very narrow and taller. So probably ventilation, you can get better for cross ventilation. So the issues in the details, you have good intentions to move forward, and I support that. But I think you need to prepare more in order to avoid benefits for a few and be negative for our community. And I strongly support that you have to have further definition, very clear, and with examples that everybody can speculate, like Anton said, in that direction. So there is no confusion. And secondly, you have to establish the bonus precisely for how many square feet provide each development it has to receive according with that. Otherwise, it's just only in the hands of how skillful is, 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 is the consultants of the developer or how connect, well connected is the developer with some uh, decision makers. So I think that is wrong in that part. And that's a concern. And that was gonna impact negatively in our community. And that is where I raise this issue. So so thank you, Marco, for the, for the the questions and the input. I, I, I can, I think, respond to your first um, point about, def, you know, definitions and, and what's ADA and what's accessible and, and probably, you know, Tony on, on the second part. So when we, um, when we say an MTA, New York City Transit Station, is ADA accessible, we have a whole list of features that that includes. So that includes, you know, an accessible path of travel, vertical access through an elevator or ramp, unless the station's at grade, um, an, an auto gate so that you can, you know, get in on your own if you use a wheelchair, have a service animal, can't use a turnstile, uh, tactile, you know, warnings at the platform edge, uh, proper braille signage, you know, and, and the list goes on. So when we say a station is ADA accessible, it includes that entire slew of features. However, we're not, um, through zoning for accessibility and just in general, we are not necessarily looking to developers to do all of that work. What, what we are hoping to achieve through this proposal is more opportunities where we can get support from the development community to either set space aside through an easement or you know, invest directly in that vertical access improvement by funding the construction of the elevator. But we, the MTA, would do, you know, if we're going to make that an accessible station and call it an accessible station, we will do the work for the rest of the features. Um, and, and you see that you know, with some of the stations across the system that have private developer funded elevators. That it's not just, you know, an elevator with none of the other ADA features of the station. So there is a, a you know, a, a set of requirements for a station to be accessible. And our, our commitment is, is to meet those when we say we're building an accessible station. Zoning for accessibility itself example. does not cover every piece of it necessarily. Let me uh, give you an example. The other day I was leaving the 80, uh, 86 station. I, I was going to the back at uh, 83rd Street. And the escalator that go up went off. And there are two stairs uh, that going down. And well, it wasn't me for a challenge. I went up and was happy. And I'm very wealthy, very healthy. And I'm extremely happy with that. But I said then later, what happened with a person that have disability, a person that is obese, a person that have problems of high pressure, uh, many other health problems. 
So what's going to happen with those people? And that is basically is coming. The issue is the definition of ADA. What is your definition? Because at that time, you had to establish that point. Then, obviously, you can request different choices and different alternatives to resolve this issue. If you don't have cleared that part, one developer said, oh, OK, this is ADA compliance, because you are not clear in that part. And that's what I start my, my complaints saying, what is it, the definition? It has to be very clear with examples so nobody can confuse. Usually the, the, the stunning resolution is an excellent book. And, and usually what, if, what is the problem is you have good intentions and the good intentions, there are other people that study very well and they go in the wrong direction and they accuse DCP doing wrong. And that is basically, we had to prepare for that moment. We had to cut the loopholes. That's what I'm saying. And that's what I'm trying to explain to you. Thank you. All right, let's go next to Alita. And I just want to make the point that we've been going on a while on this uh, issue so folks can try to keep their remarks uh, brief. That would be good or as brief as possible and not uh, go over stuff that others have said. Uh, go ahead. I'll try, Russell. Um, I don't really understand the concept of partial accessibility and full bonus because I know that there are problems in East Harlem CB11 with developers making promises and then not living up to them for the community. So this seems like a big giveaway to them. Um, and let me just preface it, although I'm a little late for a preface, that I fully believe that every station should be fully accessible. And it is really a shame and unfortunate that it has that these stations have not been made accessible. But my real overarching question is, is this the right way to go in order to make the stations accessible? So I'm not sure that partial accessibility should go with full bonus. I'm not sure, I don't really understand for, there's going to be congestion pricing why you don't wait and see what the impact is and whether any of that funding could be used to improve accessibility at the stations before enacting this kind of what I'll call a giveaway program. And second of all, third of all, I don't understand the 25% height bonus because what you're doing is increasing, it seems to me, sliver buildings that are not supposed to be permitted, but they will be permitted because 25% is an enormous amount for residential buildings that may be on small lots. And especially if they're saying the lot is so so small that they can't economically uh, do this. Um, the, you're just giving them the opportunity to create silver buildings. And last, um, I'm I really and I hate to say this because I hate that it, it is not it is true is that city planning and developers have a very cozy relationship and it's difficult to trust. We've seen the kind of response the mechanical voids got from city planning. We've seen that in the time since the voids were enacted, um, and they certainly didn't satisfy any community I know of. Um, there has been no movement towards getting rid of any of the other loopholes that developers with glee managed to um, use to their advantage. I think public-private partnerships of this nature, while, com while certainly benefiting the public, end up harming it as well, because these buildings, there is an impact, even though the city refuses to recognize what impact shadows on people has. It only looks to the impact of shadows on plants, as we well know from some other just um, ULERP issues that we're having right now. They do have an impact on people, and any health study would show that. So while there should be accessibility, I really, I just can't see that this is the right way to go and and that's a shame because it's the plan that's moved this far ahead but it's it feels like it's a giant giveaway for developers and we don't actually know when anything is going to be made accessible 500 feet is 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 big and from the, from end of platform 500 feet is blocks more than it used to be i just don't think the city ever gets what it gives away and that this will be another treat for developers at the expense of people who need accessibility and of communities at large. So I'm done, Russell. I hope that was short enough. Yeah, that was fine. Oh, yeah. Thank you. No, it was okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, next let's go to Adam Wall. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, uh, just a quick comment and two questions. Uh, Anthony knows better. He knows that the corner of 86th and 1st is a contextually zoned uh, sites that'll never get a thousand feet <laughs> development. Um, but I have real questions about process. So the first question is how are you determining the true density to a developers? And 
as it relates to neighborhoods. So for example, if uh, the elevator that I'm gonna pay for costs $8 million, how do I tr translate that into the density that I get? Yeah, so um, I mean, we're, we're, this is very explicitly not tying bonuses to the amount of money that's being spent. Um, there's too much fluctuation in what that money could potentially represent. Um, and so $8 million, uh, it, we're, we're sort of uh, agnostic on the cost of what it is. We want to know that, like, is this bonus, you know, cost is a consideration for a, a commensurateness, but it's also just, you know, is, is this providing enough to the community that we believe that this percentage bonus is appropriate? Um, and, and cost is a factor that developers will have to consider in, in thinking about pursuing this uh, because it is, it, it's going to be a significant cost to any development that wants to, to put in these types of improvements. So. Okay, and then I, my other question I have is, for other bonus programs in the city, a developer can file a new building permit while the application is still being approved or reviewed. But my understanding is that for this program, you can't even file your new building permit until the whole process is complete and approved, which from a financial standpoint doesn't really make sense because when you go for your construction loan and you do your, your pre-development costs, you need to understand timing and the scope of the project. And if you don't know when everything is gonna be approved, it doesn't really make sense that you can't file your new building permit simultaneously with filing for the application. You know, if, if, if you go to Times Square, you go to theater district, there are whole buildings that are built before the CPC gives the final certification on, you know, preservation bonuses, for example, things like that. You know, on the 45th Street or 47th Street, the whole project was built before CPC gave the full, um, the full authorization for that project to go through, which makes sense. But now it, you have to do the whole process and then apply for your new building permit once all that is done. Is, it, is there any exploration as whether that can be changed or? Uh, I mean, there has been no discussion about whether or not that can be changed. I mean, that's certain some, certainly something you can write into your recommendation um, for the CPC to consider, um, you know, as part of your, as part of the whatever resolution the, the community board puts together. Um, but, that, but that is one of the reasons that we see, you know, the, the cost of these things is going to be prohibitive to smaller developments. Like the, you're, you're going to have to have a large enough development to, to afford the cost of making these improvements going through the entire process, which is you know, time consuming and costly um, in order to, to finalize the authorization before getting your building permit. You're absolutely right. That is, that is a costly process, um, which is one of the reasons that we, we don't see every new development taking advantage of the bonus program um, because they're, they're just not gonna be able to do it um, you know, financially and, uh, and timeline wise, so. Okay. Yeah. All right, let's go to Chuck Warren. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, put that, take that, put that off. Um, I just want to put this in perspective a little bit. Uh, if you look, this is the largest uh, subway system in the world by stations. I think there's 470 some stations at the MTA and you can correct me if I'm wrong on that, but, um, and there's a history here about accessibility that goes back a long time and the MTA was very slow in doing anything about it. They had to sign a consent decree, a federal consent decree, and they were still moving at a glacial pace. Things have moved a lot faster and they're, they're trying to do a lot more. And I, I think Ms. Cohen said that uh, they have 70 stations now that they're putting a priority on. Um, and it seems to me that uh, what we're looking at here is a tool that could be helpful in certain circumstances in getting more accessibility. And I think that that's the way I'm looking at it because you don't know how many people are gonna take advantage of this. It's not, you know, doing these things uh, is not always the best thing for a particular project. It all depends on the situation and all depends on the actual facts. So um, I, don't, I don't see why, I certainly 
support something like this because I think we need accessibility. We need to get as many stations accessible at, as fast as possible. And I think it would be great if the MTA could do it all by themselves, but I think that's a that's not going to happen given the uh, you know how much money it would take to do all of these stations, and, and uh, so I think to the extent that there's an opportunity to get some additional money this way, that that's an option that ought to be on the table. So I, I support this. Thanks. Let's go next to Ematoma. Hi, I'm a new member, so this may have been um, discussed in previous meetings. Um, I hear a lot about um, what's being done for um, people getting from, let's say, the street level to platform level. My husband has MS. He's gone from using a walker to using a scooter to using a... Um, a uh, wheelchair that he could uh, operate to now being in a wheelchair where he has to be pushed by someone. Um, I'm concerned and I'd like to know from the MTA um, about transferring from the platform onto a train. We hardly, I think I've used the Second Avenue subway twice with him only because it's a horror to get on the train once even on the platform. And I'd like to know if anything's being done about that and um, whether these bonuses cover this. Yeah, so so platform gaps, what, what I think you're referring to, right? Any any gap between the platform edge and the train, both the horizontal gap or a vertical gap. Um, I would say, you know, second to elevators is probably the, the accessibility issue that we hear about and, and think the most about. So it, it's incredibly important. Um, I'm frankly, uh, disappointed to hear that you've had that problem on Second Avenue Subway, and I would be interested to hear more about the specific stations and, and cases. Um, newly built stations uh, and stations that have recently been renovated should not have that issue. So it, there's a there is a tolerance, you know, under the ADA for gaps. You can have an up to two inch or um, sorry vertical gap, you know, either above or below the platform. Our trains always run above, um, and up to a four inch horizontal gap. And that's just because, you know, it's, it's not possible, right, to have no gap all the time. We're running different car classes, different length trains, you know, there's a lot of variables. But those, you know, those tolerances are pretty small, and we should be within them at every accessible station. Um, and if we're not, and if we hear that we're not, you know, we will go out, we'll survey, we'll remediate, there are a number of different things we can do. So, you know, like I said, I, I'm pretty troubled to hear that that on Second Avenue, you've, you've had that problem, and I would like to hear more. But um, that's something that we remedy through either work at the platform edge, you know, we create kind of a, sometimes a, a vertically raised area in the middle of the platform for level boarding, or we change the track alignment to physically bring the train closer to the platform if it's out of alignment for whatever reason. So depending on the specific situation, those are some of the approaches we would take. Um, it's certainly part of what makes a station accessible. And, you know, when we talked about our definition of accessibility, it includes compliant gaps. So um, again, you know, if we needed platform work, that is something that a developer could, could support as part of, you know, probably be part of a package, um, for the bonus, but, um, it's, it's also, you know, definitely something that, that we have in mind and, and maybe, you know, we can learn more about the specific stations that, that you've used. Yeah. Great. All right. Next let's go. Uh, we have a member of the public, Wendy McIver, so you'll get uh, two minutes. Can Wendy uh, unmute? Will? Uh, 
Will, you there? Can you not hear me? Yeah, now I hear you. Oh, I said she she has a slow computer. She said that doesn't think we're down. I suggested maybe we see if somebody else. Okay, it's, uh, it's a little tough to hear you, but I, I hear you now. Okay, so let's go to uh, Rita. Go ahead, Rita. Hi. Um, you know, I am, like everybody else, certainly for accessible uh, transportation for uh, ADA people. However, at this rate, th this won't get even settled in 50 years. And I get really nervous or, you know, it's like once burned, twice shy, that when you talk about bonuses and um, they suddenly become for sale and then the developer sells it bonus uh, and the people don't get the benefit of it. Why can't every single developer and of course, I'm talking in Manhattan, whether you're on First Avenue, you're still saying near transportation. If you're on Lexington Avenue, you are above transportation. Why can't you have a flat edict that everybody, every developer who is developed, who is going to develop in New York City that a bonus that they they may receive a bonus but they have to give they have to pay toward the the uh, construction or else this is not going to get done it won't get done in 50 years so I I I, I don't I want to support it but I I can't support it and it's its current state, I don't trust it. I don't, I once burned, twice shy. We know what happened to affordable housing. Uh, people said, they, yes, I'll do affordable housing only to find out that they got the credits in New York in the city and they built it out in the outer boroughs. Uh, and so people didn't, didn't really benefit from it or what is affordable? So uh, I'm leery. I'm leery. I don't. I. I wonder if there is a way that you can uh, make it mandatory. You want to build in New York City? Wherever you build in the city, you're near transportation. Thank you. Yeah, I, 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 I can respond really quickly to, to just a couple of parts of that. Okay. Yeah. One, the, the mandatory part of it was something that, that Russell brought up as well, or maybe maybe Russell, somebody brought up as well. And that, that's sort of a legislative process that we would need legislators to approve us making something mandatory. Um, the, other, the second part of this is that this is very different than the affordable housing uh, scenarios that you were describing, which are unfortunate uh, in the sense that developers cannot transfer bonuses anywhere except, you know, it can only be utilized on the site that they own and build them on. Um, and, and uh, uh, only occupy that bonus once the transit improvement is fully built and functional. And so that there is really no bonus without the, the benefit um, built into this zoning text. Thanks, all right. I see Wendy uh, has now been unmuted. So Wendy, you have your uh, two minutes. Thanks so much for, uh, for giving me the opportunity and for being patient with uh, all kinds of weird communications and electronics. Um, I, I really wanna thank the, the uh, two representatives for coming. I think the, uh, the accessibility issue is really essential. I, I was a caregiver for over 10 years to both of my parents who ended up in wheelchairs and uh, the subways were really off limits, especially on Lexington Avenue. And this is a really essential service for the health, safety and welfare of people. I wanted to throw in there that door width is between 32 and 48 inches generally under section 404 of the ADA, in case anybody's interested. And they're supposed to be uh, various uh, radii of being able to swing around. I want to tell you that as somebody who had to deal with two wheelchairs, it was very helpful to have the elevators accommodate two wheelchairs. Some of them do not. So I wanted to throw that in there. Um, we, we have a local uh, movement, maybe not so local, it's really citywide, to enact an absolute 
non-negotiable 210 foot height cap. We have it on Fifth Avenue and Madison Avenue and or one side of Lexington. And uh, we have other zoning considerations that we see uh, that there are many attempts to chip away at and we are fiercely uh, in the process of defending local zoning. This appears to be something that would take away from local zoning initiatives and, and, and fiercely won battles. And I really uh, you know, respect that it's very difficult to find financing. And this is certainly one creative attempt to do that, but there are other financing uh, options available. And I, I'm certainly not an expert in, in municipal finance. I think I took a course in it in 1988, but there are certainly wonderful experts out there. There are, there are bonds and there are other requirements and tax abatements for developers and such, but height isn't the way to go that's going to be uh, accept, acceptable in our community. I think people have kind of danced around it very politely. I'm a member of the public, so I guess I don't have to be quite as polite. I'm a voter and these are my streets and they're the streets of my neighbors and my friends and residents and workers around here and sticking uh, extra tall buildings here and uh, increasing the density is not appropriate, as well as the fact that it uh, creates an untenable amount of climate change pollution that cannot be abated even with LEED's platinum certification. Thanks so much for letting me speak. Thank you. Uh, Rebecca Dangor. I, I move that we uh, support this proposal. Okay, Lori has seconded. Uh, I'm gonna move that we sever the uh, to the easement from the um, the bonus, the two Yeah, I accept that as a friendly it. amendment. Okay. All right, next let's go to Ed Hartsock. Thanks, Russell. I, I, don't ask a really, I'll just ask a really um, silly question. Uh, maybe it's, it's in the materials. I don't see them, in, um, I don't have them in front of me. So I apologize um, if the uh, answer is uh, right in front of me. Um, how much are we talking about? Just just so I know in terms of dollars, what what is it, what are we talking about in terms of spending on these 70 sites that you've identified, these 70 stations to make them you know, ADA compliant? The way you're talking about what's that number so there's five billion dollars allocated in the capital plan for for all of the you know ada and kind of associated work at those seven stations so, okay so five billion and and let me ask what what would it cost to do the whole the whole whack the whole system the whole schmear everything that's outstanding what is that just i know indulge me just indulge me and just tell me what that number is if you know it uh, it's not that I, I don't know it. I mean, it's it's a really hard question to answer because things change over time, right? Costs, unfortunately, too often go up, but sometimes they go down. We've actually put projects out recently and had bids come in low. So I, there, I can't put a number on it, but I can say that we're doing 70 stations with 5 billion in this plan. And, you know, we have, as somebody mentioned, 470 transit stations, 20 Staten Island Railway, you know, a number of remaining commuter rail stations. So you know, we could, you could impute out the math right back of the envelope based on how many stations are left. So I don't know how many are left. So what is, what is it on the About back? About 300, 350 transit stations to go. 350 and 5 billion for 70. So you're talking 25, 30 billion? It, it's really hard to put a number on it, but I mean, but, you can, you know, that's, okay. those, well, those I, are the numbers of stations don't worry, left. I'm not talking about yeah. for, when, for when you go back to the office and they go, oh my God, you just pinned us down and, you know, they're going to use it in our next budget hearing. I'm not trying to do that to you. No, I understand. I understand. But, I'm just, that's, that's what's out there, right? So. What, what I'm asking about is just a, a re, looking through this reverse, okay? Instead of handing out the bonus and working out all that stuff, and, and I know we're probably late in the system, but, you know, with talk in Washington, and, and, you know, and, and the previous administration with the money and the, the printing of it, whatever the amounts are, the, the zeros are, are overwhelming. And my point is 30 billion, 50 billion in, in today, you know, Everett Dirksen is spinning, but um, we're at the billion and trillion line and 50, the numbers they're talking about in DC, I'm just saying, get the 50 from our, our, our just recently attended senior majority leading senator from New York and bill all the developers. And instead of asking and going through all the machinations in the future, just build it out, okay? And move, I'm just saying in terms of speed, putting people to work, 
and then in the future say to people you're developing guess what we just did a capital program in your neighborhood guess what your share is when you build out boom bang here it is here's the bill no uh, thing up or down this is what it is you do an npv the whole bit I, I just throwing it out there i know it's it, it can't happen for this but just in terms of speed and 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 some of these other issues that i hear people talking about um, that are they're very real issues and that just in, in terms of listening to my colleagues who are very smart on all of these issues it's very hard to vote on this i think that's why we're splitting it because it's very hard you've got them wed together and it's it's very hard right so if you if you vote if you vote against this you're voting against accessibility and but you have good reasons you know what i'm saying so that's that's all it's more comment than question but just sort of throwing it out there that's all thanks next let's go to trisha shimamura Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, and I, I really appreciate your comments because I, I feel you on this one. I feel very conflicted here, but I just wanted to get some clarity um, to the presenters. Can you just for one more time explain who decides who gets the size of bonus? Is that ultimately, I thought, I think that you said CPC is where that decision lies. Can you clarify and just confirm that? Yeah, so, so bonuses are pursued through an authorization. So that first goes to the CPC, who then refers it out to the community board uh, to have, you know, same as this process, um, who can compose a resolution on it, and then it goes back to the CPC. The, would the first time it comes from the CPC, would it, would it come to the community board with like a, we're going to approve this for 15% F increase of bonus or something like that? Or would that, what, what are, I guess, more specifics about that? Yeah, so I mean, it, ultimately, you know, a, a developer puts a proposal before the CPC. Um, so it's not a, it's not, it's not typically. Uh, if, if the developer says we want to build, you know, X, Y, and Z, the MTA has confirmed that these are necessary improvements, and we would like, you know, a bonus of twelve percent. They can pursue that application, and it comes to the CPC, who can. Who, who will say like, okay, you're, you've completed all of your materials. We're going to refer it out to the community board to see what they say. Um, so it's, it's, you know, it's not the CPC determining what that percentage is. Um, it's, you know, an ongoing conversation between the developer, the MTA, the city planning commission and the community board who also determines is it commensurate or not. But wouldn't the, wouldn't the developer always propose the maximum amount of, of increase that they, that they could receive? Uh, I mean, not necessarily. Developers are going to have to spend a lot of money on, you know, uh, architects, engineers, and lawyers uh, to go through the entire process of working with DCP, getting it to a place where it's presented to the city planning commission and sent to the community board. Um, like, if they don't believe that what they're proposing is going to get approved, they're typically not going to propose it. Um, and so, you know, they, they can always come out with 20% if they want, but if, if realistically what they're proposing is not commensurate with the bonus that they're providing, then it's really not in their benefit to, to go for 20%. It's in their benefit to go for what they actually think, you know, is reasonable. Okay. And, um, and I guess, okay. Um, I think that I agree with the comments pre pre previously to this that we're talking about the problems here in process. Um, I think that I, I too have hesitations about developer led initiatives that that um, that really we are responding to whatever a developer puts forward. I too share concerns about partial accessibility and what what can be received um, from those. I think that uh, Rebecca, I know that you proposed this go through or you have the resolution on the floor on the floor supporting this. I think that if we go forward with that, then I then we need to really talk about uh, specifics about what would be changed uh, in this. And I so I would encourage us to, to really think about the language there. I do think that, like I said, a partial accessibility is, is as Rebecca Lamort said, not accessible and why we would be giving away bonuses to that I think is is really problematic. Um, who decides and the role of the community board and what say what what the community what um, kind of input the community truly has in this is problematic. Um, the um, the pro the amount of a bonus based on based on uh, and who decides that 
I think is also should be considered. Um, so all of those things I would encourage us to think about before we pass a resolution on this. Okay, let's go next to Lo Vandervalk from the public. Um, we'll give him two minutes. Yes, my name is, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Good. Uh, th thank you, Russell. Uh, my name is Lo Vandervalk. I'm representing Carnegie Hill Neighbors. So I want to make clear that we, su we support accessibility. I think everyone does, but it's 30 years overdue. Um, and, uh, and we thank the two representatives from the MTA and, and the city planning to answer our questions. Uh, that said, uh, we are of course concerned about our other uh, zoning interests uh, to limit the height of buildings that have been part of various community board aid resolutions. Um, I won't go into the details, but the, the point is made. Uh, we, why can't we limit the language to improvements for elevators only and let the MTA do, other, do the other improvements as it sees, sees fit? That would limit the extent of, of the reach of what's going on, what's being proposed. Also, um, this, be, this, this sets up a source of funding that can go into the future um, and and we we would like the considerations for some kind of sunset provisions when when maybe 80 or 90 percent of the goals are met or after 10 years and let the MTA then carry on to complete the project. Um, but we stress this should happen. There should be a push as fast as possible to get economical economical elevators to ensure vertical access. And then finally, on the redundancy questions, of course, you, you might want redundancy because you can't always be assured of good repairs. Uh, and also you don't know what the growth is. So maybe, uh, maybe factored into this, uh, let, let the MTA pay for the redundancy, but we want to get the elevators there as fast as possible. Uh, also, my final comment is, can, can your resolution allow for the community board A to give supplemental commentary at at the uh, at the city planning uh, at the at the city planning commission consideration of the proposals. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Next, let's go to Billy Freeland. Uh, thank you, Tony. Uh, thank you, Rachel, for the presentation. Um, I just want to tick through a few questions. Um, you indicated earlier that uh, this would essentially require, if a developer wants the bonus, taking care of elevators first. You later, I think, said that you use elevators as a bit of a catch-all that refers to literal elevators, but could also refer to ramps. Um, I wanted to verify that I've characterized that correctly. And I want to ask specifically, because I have the um, annotated uh, text amendment in front of me. Do you know offhand where in the text amendment, it would specify that a developer has to do the elevators first before um, they'd get a bonus for any other accessibility improvements? Uh, you are correct. I, I cannot point you to the exact part of the text, but that's something that I can ask our zoning division to give me clarification on, and I can get that to you. Okay, great. And then I wanna just, you get a little practical uh, with some examples in our own district. Um, so if elevators go first, let's say a developer is near the 77th street stop on the Lexington line, they want the bonus. Are they required to put in elevators uh, that grant access to both sides of the platform or would they be in compliance for putting in you know, one elevator on say the uptown side? Uh, do you do you mean in terms of applying for for a bonus? Yeah, yeah, they, it could be applicable to one side, not both necessarily. It depends on what what type of bonus they're seeking and whether or not um, it's deemed to be commensurate with what they're asking for. Okay, thank you. That's helpful. And then take the example of Eighty Sixth Street, then, um, where you have an elevator that has that you know goes to the uptown side, and I think on the only on the local platform. Um, is 
I'm trying to think of how to phrase this question. Would you view that station as already having sufficient elevator accessibility that a developer in that case could get the bonus by doing some other accessibility improvement because there's already one elevator there? No, that is not, that is not a fully accessible station. Then where I struggle is why is it in the case of 77th Street, if they put in the elevator on the one side, it's still not fully accessible. Um, why would that be okay to give them a bonus for putting in that elevator when they, they still haven't made the station fully accessible? I guess, is this where we get back into this partial versus fully debate? Can you just walk me through that one more time? So the, in either case, the, the developer would uh, need to be proposing an, ex, an ADA accessibility improvement to be eligible for the bonus. We, uh, may not, depending on the site conditions, the size of the bonus, the size of the site, et cetera, it may not be commensurate with a 20% bonus to, to ask the developer to put in multiple elevators. You know, sometimes it's three or four elevators to make a station accessible. But in, in both of those cases, the improvement would be an accessibility improvement to the station. So, you know, at 77, they'd be starting with the first elevator. At, at 86, they'd be moving on to the, the second or the third. Uh, but it's all, you know, steps toward toward that same goal. And and in in either case, you know, you would have to make the accessibility improvement first before being eligible for a bonus for another station improvement. I don't know if that answers your question. But. Yeah, I, I think it helps me a little bit. And then I want to turn to the other concern I've heard from some members. Um, and I think I raised this at our last meeting, which is if you take the Second Avenue subway. Um, I believe that's already fully accessible. It's our newest stations. Um, and the indication you've given us is that, well, developers probably wouldn't be able to get a bonus for make, trying to make improvements to that station. But I guess, what assurances can you give us that that's the case, that if we approve this, that we're not signing on to something that then developers start to use to um, go taller on, on First Ave and on Second Ave? Is that anywhere written or in the text amendment that the second Avenue subway is not really going to be sort of quote unquote eligible here. Uh, no, it's it's not written into the text. Uh, my assertion with that was simply to say, with any given station, there are only so many improvements to accessibility that the uh, MTA is is looking for in a particular station. Those stations would have significantly fewer, if 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 any, uh, needed improvements, and so uh, the 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 applicability in that area just uh, seems diminished based on existing conditions on the ground. Um, and most of First Avenue is actually not even within 500 feet of those stations. It's really only at 80, that small corner of 86th. Um, but no, there's there's nothing that, you know, explicitly says Second Avenue is off the table. It's just, you know, based on what's already there, it's highly unlikely. Okay. Um, so I just want to, you know, thank Donna Messenger for speaking earlier. I mean, it's, I kind of view this as a moral issue. Like it's, you know, for those of us who haven't had to deal with any mobility issues, it's hard to fully understand, but you're living in a completely different world if you're trying to navigate the subway system uh, using a wheelchair uh, or, you know, even using a cane. And so I think it's really urgent that we support something like this. Um, I think we all have questions and probably I imagine a resolution that we pass is going to, you know, have some conditions and I'm worried about developers trying to game this in a way that, you know, gets around, you know, putting in the um, elevator accessibility. So that's why I was asking about finding that language, but I do think, um, you know, we, we're not going to get manna from heaven from Washington to suddenly make all of our subways accessible. I just don't see it happening. And so I guess the question for all of us is, you know, how do we feel to be navigating uh, the system in a wheelchair and voting on something, you know, that's really going to determine, I think, the future of the system's accessibility. And I've heard many of my colleagues say, well, we're all for accessibility. But I mean, the question is really, are we really like, you know, this is yet again, another example, in my opinion, of you know, kind of wishful thinking that, oh, we can just pass the buck on this and then hope we're going to get a sudden infusion of $50 billion of capital expenditure for accessibility. It's not happening. 
it's not happening. And the MTA subway capital needs are so great that the idea that the entire capital budget is going to go to accessibility, we would just be kidding ourselves. So I feel very strongly that we should um, support something here that echoes our concerns, echoes our questions, but makes clear that, um, you know, it's long past due to improve the accessibility of the system. So I'll leave it there. Uh, thanks for answering my questions. I'm going to just suggest a friendly amendment here to Rebecca. Um, I would like, you know, for the second resolution that deals with the bonus, instead of having it be an authorization that only requires, you know, ultimate CPC um, approval, I would like for us to suggest that it be a, a the bonus be a ULERP item. So it would, uh, you know, there would be more stringent review of it. And then the other um thing I would like to add is a requirement essentially that it be limited to vertical uh, accessibility because I think that's the that's the prime concern that I've heard from a lot of folks and I think that uh, it limits the, the the potential for abuse so those are those are two essentially conditions I guess that I would attach to our approval as a, as a um, amendment. completely accepted I just wanted to kind of get the conversation moving in a direction I think a conditional uh, supportive resolution is, is very appropriate. Okay, thank you. All right, so let's, uh, I, I want to uh, get this going here. I'm gonna go to Peggy Price and Jane Parshall. Uh, well, let me go to Peggy Price first. Thanks very much. Uh, I have a question about accessibility that isn't perhaps directly related to developers, but I've noticed for, um, with the subway trains that, um, it isn't quite easy for um, handicapped people to get in and out of the train, um, in part because the doors close so quickly and, um, and people can get actually stuck. At, even people who are not handicapped are pushing the door open to get onto the train when they are crowded. Is there anything in this plan that would make it easier for uh, the disabled to get on and off the train without running into closed doors closing on it? Or that's not part of this proposal? I think it's a fair concern, but really outside the scope of this proposal. I, I don't think, unfortunately, we can get a uh, developers to to uh, train our train operators and conductors on door closing procedures, but it's a point well taken. Thank you. Uh, Jean. Thank you, Russell. I've been listening to this debate and we've discussed this bill or this resolute this um, concept before. It seems to me that there are so very, very many reservations about the language, about the direction, about the role of developers, the role of the MTA, the role of the City Planning Commission. So very many questions that even with friendly amendments in an effort to sort of have some input into the final resolution um, just seems very strange to me after I've listened to all of my community board members express their opinions. I'm for accessibility, but I'm gonna to have to vote against this this um, concept. Thank you. Okay. All right, so in the interest of time here, I'm gonna call the question because uh, everybody who still has their hand up uh, has spoken before. So um, is there a second to that? Yes, Ed Hartzog, okay. All right, so I think, uh, and that's a call the question on, on both. So, um, why don't we do the first one first, which is the easement, and then the other one will be the uh, um, the bonus with the friendly amendments for conditions. Rebecca, you're muted, or I, I can't hear you. Oh, sorry. If you would like to vote no, abstain, or not vote for cause, please raise your hand. Uh. I, I, I'm sorry. I apologize. We are voting right now on the easement. Oh, okay. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. All right. Michelle. Um, I'm, I'm voting. No, I, it's just, just the sorry, wrong Michelle, you just way gotta, to fund this. So yeah, yeah, anyway, that's okay. okay. No, 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 no. Elaine. 
No. Sherry Wiener? No. All right, I'll give everyone like three more seconds. A reminder, if you're on the phone, it star nine to raise your hand, and then it'll be star six to unmute. So if you're on the phone. Barbara Chalky. Barbara, unmute. Yeah, I regret that I have to vote no. Okay. Got it. All right, seeing no other hands, the motion passes um, with a vote of 37 to four to zero. Wait, uh, wait, wait, wait. I think Jane and- uh, oh, Jane. Elizabeth Ashby too, so Jane. Is, uh, I wanted to vote no, and I had too much trouble with the, the thing. I want okay, to Elizabeth, I you. have you. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Elizabeth, of course. Sorry, I didn't see your, your hand. No. So that is now, um, sorry, I'm trying to do quick math. Uh, 35 to 6 to 0. Oh. So you, you have me as a no, Rebecca? Wilma. I yeah, I do. Thank you. Wilma? Wilma Johnson, star six to unmute. You have, do we have my vote? Are you voting? Did you, are, did you mean to vote yes? Yes. Okay, yeah, we have your vote. Okay, great, thank you. Um, really good to see you. Ima, Toma, were you voting no? Okay, in the future, raise your hand and we'll unmute you to do that. But uh, yeah, use, the, use the raise hand feature. Oh, sorry. She missed the beginning of our, our orientation, so I should have realized that. That's okay. Yeah, so Ema, the same, use the same raise hand feature that you used to, to raise your hand to speak. Yeah, exactly. And then unmute. All right, so let's unmute her. Go ahead. No. Okay. Got it. All right. So the final tally is 34 to 7. So the motion passes. Okay. Let's do the next one. Okay. I'll do that. Um, uh, and this is on the bonusing program, I think. And uh, so if you are voting no. Yeah, with the conditions. Uh, yes, uh, no um, uh, abstaining or not voting for cause, if you would raise your hands um, and I'll um, not surprisingly start with me and I'm voting no. And uh, Barbara. You Barbara would Chucky. unmute Barbara Chalky. There we go. I have to vote no. Okay, thank you, Barbara. Um, Peter Patch. No. Okay, Peter, no. Um, then we have Elaine. No. Okay, Elaine Walsh. Uh, Michelle. No. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, Elizabeth Ashby? No. Uh, Alita? No. Okay. Um, Ed Hartzog? Uh, I'm going to abstain. Abstain? Okay. Uh, Hartzog, abstain. Okay. Uh, Sherry Wiener? I think she needs to be unmuted. Uh, no. There you go. No uh, for Sherry. Uh, Peggy Price. Abstain. Abstain. Okay. Uh, Jane Partial. No. Thank you, Jane. Uh, Marco. Abstain. Abstain. Uh, Sarah Chu. 
abstain, please. Okay, thank you, Sarah. And Rita Popper. No. Uh, no. So that is, how are we doing? All right, it'll take us a minute. It's a little more complicated than usual. So perhaps we can go on and we'll um, uh, announce it in a minute. Sure. I think well, that's a perfect um, perfect right. opportunity for me to just recognize that today is Wilma Johnson's birthday. So I just want to wish her happy birthday on behalf of the board. And you can see there's a lot of applause from uh, everybody in the, uh, in the gallery here. So I just want to say, Wilma, happy birthday to you. And uh, hope you're enjoying the day. And I'm sorry that we've had to pin you down here for part of it for this, uh, this meeting. But uh, hope you're enjoying it. Nice try, Russell. And I think Anne... Uh -huh. Go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say you can take it away. Oh, OK. And so what we have here is it appears uh, the uh, resolution passed uh, 27 yes, 10 no, uh, four abstentions. OK. And I just want to speak into the record. Elizabeth Throws is calling in from the phone for the first time, I think. And she's having problems raising her hand. And she's emailing me her votes. I'll read them into the record in a second. Okay. okay. But one of them is at least said no. I just need to confirm whether it's both. Okay. Um, all right. I'm going to suggest that we move to the next item. Um, if given that we have a resolution, I, I'm going to call briefly on uh, Michelle and Alita, but I'm, I'm really wanting to, uh, to move on here. So Michelle, go ahead. And, and Gil Barron was a no on the second one. Mm. Thanks awesome. Russell. Uh, about the the, the um, accessibility issue, can I just suggest that we as a board take up consideration of un other funding mechanisms, for example, because this was really about the method. This was not about the accessibility. Yeah. Um, offering me, like tax abatements, selling bonds, I suggest, federal monies. Yeah, go ahead. Why don't you email me offline and, and that's something that you know we can have one of the committees. Well, is there at. any way we can do a resolution about that tonight? No. In other words, if I don't, I, I in don't other words, to... for them to look, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm overlapping because I can't hear you. I, I I'm just suggesting, I'm just suggesting that I could think of at least four additional funding or alternative funding mechanisms. And maybe as a board, if we don't want to decide on one, maybe I can't now make that resolution, but yeah, maybe I think somebody. That's a, it's going to require a fair amount of discussion. I think it's a great idea, but I think it's something that we have to just say for another meeting. I think we should, you know, it should be a committee consideration and, and sort of go through that mm -hmm. process. Um, all right, next let's go to Alita. Well, this is entirely off topic, but I want to say that I spoke to Wilma today and she's one of the artists exhibiting at the art show. So happy birthday, Wilma. Thanks, Thank Russell. You. Sure. All right, let's move to the next item. And so let's have the presentation, please, on uh, hotel special permits. Okay, so you're, you're gonna hear from me a bit more. Yes, thanks, Tony, and thanks for, for sticking with us. Yeah, of course. All right, so I'm gonna, oh, uh, I need to be able to share my screen, Will. For it now, you can. Great. <clears throat> Okay, um, I apologize. Does anybody know how I can hide this little bar on the side? Uh, I think if you go, well, maybe if I just go into presentation mode, I, I apologize. I'm yeah, sorry. that, yeah. A different computer than I'm used to, so. Oh boy, nope, not that way. I'm sorry, folks. I know it's getting late. <laughs> That's okay. That's all right. Bottom okay. screen next to the slider. Oh, there you go. You got it. Um, I'm still seeing. It. Can you all see this little box with all of your faces on it, though? No. No. Oh, perfect. Great then. Okay. Um, so, thanks for sticking with us. I know it's late. Um, so, the second uh, proposal that I want to put before you tonight is um, the hotel special permit. Um, so this is. So this project is another zoning text amendment. Um, what it would do is create a new special permit for hotel development across the city. Um, so the goal is to create a more consistent framework for hotel development and ensure that new hotels do not negatively affect their surrounding area. 
So to start with, um, it's helpful to have a description of New York City's hotel market over the past decade. Um, so by 2019, uh, before the pandemic hit, New York City experienced record growth in the tourism industry and its hotel pipeline uh, for the 10th consecutive year. So visitor trends peaked in 2019 with almost 67 million visitors, up from 46 million in 2009. Visitor count was forecasted to increase even more in 2020 uh, to almost 69 million visitors. Um, furthermore, sizable growth of hotel room supply has been a prevailing factor in New York City for much of the past decade. Between 2009 and 2019, the total number of hotel rooms in the New York City market grew from just over 80,000 to 127,800. In the past five years, New York City saw a 40% increase in its hotel inventory. Despite this increase, hotel room occupancy, demand, um, also continued, um, despite this increase in supply, um, hotel room demand um, continued to rise with an annual occupancy at almost 87%, um, which is significantly higher uh, than many urban markets across the United States. The growth of the New York City market of the last decade was driven by both international and domestic travelers. Um, many of the visitors coming to New York City came for its cultural offerings with shopping and sightseeing being the principal reasons uh, listed by 86% of international visitors. So over the years, rapid growth of new hotels across different districts of the city has led to concerns about conflicts with surrounding uses. Um, notably in 2018, a special permit was adopted for hotels in M1 districts to address conflicts between hotels and the operations of industrial businesses. Uh, to address these concerns, the City Planning Commission has adopted a variety of special permits relating to hotel development in special districts. Uh, but what this has done is it's resulted in an inconsistent framework for regulating hotels. Uh, furthermore, in C and, uh, I'm sorry, in commercial and mixed use districts, hotels have introduced conflicts with surrounding uses. Um, overnight accommodations differ from other as of right uses in proximity because they're similar to both commercial and residential uses, uh, but they also have the potential to conflict with both. Um, this unique distinction of hotels uh, may require additional scrutiny to ensure that they are developed in ways that won't present conflicts with, neighbor, with neighborhood uh, and local businesses. Uh, a robust tourism economy is vital to the city's economic health, uh, which we expect to recover from the pandemic. But once the industry recovers from the pandemic, hotel development is expected to resume. Uh, the pattern of hotel development over the last 15 years still indicate a need to ensure that ho hotel development does not create conflict with surrounding uses. So thus the proposed text amendment would create a consistent zoning framework for new hotels and allow the CPC to evaluate each hotel's development impact on the future use and development of the surrounding area. So hotels have a potential to create land use conflicts in a variety of contexts and zoning districts. Um, for example, we're already aware of the potential conflicts hotels can have in uh, light manufacturing or uh, M1 districts. However, several C districts in the city also have hotels uh, in areas where it can be in conflict with nearby businesses, um, or the site may uh, be planned in a way uh, that is unsafe for guests and residents. So uh, looking at these pictures specifically, the hotel in the C8 district in the top left corner um, is located across the street from a cemetery and is surrounded by heavy commercial uses, uh, potentially not an appropriate location for a hotel. The hotel in the C62 district in the bottom left is an example where the hotel is set back from the street, from the street uh, creating a less than ideal pedestrian environment. The hotel in the bottom right is in the Rockaways and is a hotel uh, and is a hotel where better site planning may have led to a wider sidewalk. Um, the current sidewalk leading to the beach is thin um, and often pushes pedestrians into the street, causing safety concerns for guests um, and residents alike. Um, and similarly, the hotel in the top right uh, the C4, is in a C43A district uh, and it forces vehicles to drive over the sidewalk through uh, a very large curb cut, um, which presents conflicts with pedestrians. So the new special permit will be applicable in higher density commercial districts, mixed use districts, and paired M1 slash residential districts where there is not a special permit today. 
the new special permit will apply to those areas that already have a special permit. M1 districts will retain the findings from the M1 hotel special permit since those addressed unique concerns in light industrial areas. So this slide shows the applicability of the proposed special permit in community board eight. Um, so community board eight is sort of center screen there. Um, the pinkish color is uh, where the new special permit would apply. You can see it applies to um, those sort of higher density uh, districts that are essentially the avenues through um, the Upper East Side. Um, but then some applicability um, on uh, 86th Street and, and, and other smaller areas of uh, uh, east-west apl applicability. Oh, and the, the other part of that map, sorry, is the, the gray areas, which you can see there's some limited uh, applicability um, sort of in the, the northeast corner uh, of the area where there's already an existing hotel special permit uh, because it's an M district. So uh, similar to um, M1 districts, uh, we will not require a special permit for hotels that are a public purpose, such as temporary housing for the homeless. Uh, this means that rules for siting of homeless facilities will not change and will continue to be permitted as of right in districts where they are currently allowed. Um, while we understand there are concerns, uh, the proposal is intended to address the land use concerns related to commercial hotels specifically and is neutral with regard uh, to current policies regarding homelessness. Um, so uh, I briefly want to touch on recent impacts of the pandemic on the hotel industry uh, and ways that we've modified this proposal to try to address those challenges. Um, so the COVID pandemic also had a significant effect on New York City's hotel market. Uh, between January and November of 2020, a net total of 146 hotels um, out of 705 uh, and over 42,000 rooms have closed. Uh, luxury and upscale room types accounted for about 85% of this hotel loss. Uh, estimates by the city's independent budget office placed job losses in the hospitality and leisure industry at around 197,000 jobs in 2020. So COVID has, an ha has had an impact on the hotel industry, uh, but there's optimism that the city will recover, visitors will return, uh, and many experts uh, place this full recovery uh, in 2025. With that return uh, in demand, the Department of City Planning anticipates development to return to pre-pandemic levels, leading to a need for the special permit allowing for better regulation. However, we do not want these regulations to prevent the recovery of the city. Um, it's, it's also worth noting 96.3% of these room closures happened in Manhattan. So because of the significant impacts that the pandemic is having on the hotel industry, we've created several provisions to minimize the likelihood that the special permit will impair the recovery of the hotel industry. So these include, uh, the first is uh, modified vesting rules. So the modified vesting provisions to facilitate, uh, are, are meant to facilitate projects that are already in the pipeline. So aging projects filed with DOB prior to 2018 need to obtain a foundation permit prior to their adoption. Uh, prior to the adoption of this. Projects filed between January 1st, 2018 and referral need to obtain uh, zoning plan approval from DOB prior to adoption. Uh, and both categories of vested projects will have six years instead of the standard two from the date of adoption to complete construction. Um, second part, uh, so approved CPC or BSA applications will not require a special permit if these applications were approved after January 1st, 2018, uh, and applications that begin CPC public review or are filed with BSA prior to adoption will not require a special permit. And then finally, there is an extended discontinuance provision allowing vacant hotels extra time to return to transient use. Uh, usual discontinuance allows for a building that has been vacant for two years to reopen with its previous use. We are proposing an extension to six years to allow for closed hotels to reopen. Um, these provisions are meant to allow for a portion of the 42,000 closed rooms to return, bringing back an important industry in New York City. Uh, a draft environmental impact statement and market study were done uh, to understand what the projected loss in rooms would mean for the hotel and uh, tourism industries. 
uh, findings of the study and DEIS show we expect sufficient inventory by 2030 to support the amount of pre-pandemic visitors, uh, such which is back to a robust tourism economy. However, uh, because of the special permit being expected to slow the growth of new hotels, it's expected that there would be there would not be enough rooms to meet demand uh, of the no action in 2035, leading to a shortfall uh, of about 47,000 rooms. Uh, because of the future shortfall of rooms and potential effects on visitation, uh, the DEIS is showing a significant adverse impact on the hotel and tourism industries. Uh, however, we expect that as visitation recovers, the concerns that have been raised with respect to hotel development over the last 15 years uh, will once again arise focusing attention on the subject of this proposal, which is the regulation of how and where hotels are built. Um, this is the specific text uh, and findings of the special permit. Um, so it identifies the districts where this would have applicability. Um, and then the bolded part at the end of this is sort of uh, the, the most important part in the findings. Uh, in order to grant the special permit, the city planning commission shall find that such use will not impair the future use or development of the surrounding area. Uh, and with that, I'm happy to answer uh, any questions that you have. Um, my colleague, Scott Williamson, uh, is here as well, um, who might have additional knowledge on, on this particular text amendment. Thank you. All right, Rebecca Dangor. Hi, am I unmuted? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Uh, I have yet to hear a legitimate, even defensible land use rationale for this particular proposal. I find the timing skeptical and even of concern in and of itself. I'm vehemently opposed to this proposal and the unnecessary increase of time, cost, and uncertainty to future hotel projects. And I fear the impact this will have to both our city's development and economy. Thank you. All right, next let's go to Michelle Birnbaum. Um, yeah, how are you defining, you, you talk about hotels in, at some point in the presentation and then you talk about transient hotels in the other. Hotels is it trans? Hotels. Yeah, so uh, hotels and transient hotels are both uh, defined terms within the zoning resolution. So it was just to make the distinction that this applies to commercial hotels, um, but that the regulations around transient hotels will remain as they are. So can, do you, can you define transient hotels? Uh, I, I don't have the zoning resolution and definitions in front of me at the moment, I'm sorry. Well, if this, if this zoning resolution change made that distinction, it seems to me it'd be very hard to decide on it without knowing the definitions of each. The other concern that I have is I think in addition to the pandemic having uh, you know, um, and such an impact on this industry, so does crime. And I think um, one of the reasons we, the tourism industry was flourishing is because we were considered to be one of the safest, largest cities uh, in the country, if not in the world. Uh, we've got a ways to come back to that designation and the shootings in Times Square would not help. So I certainly hope that um, development comes back, tourism comes back. It's the lifeblood of this city, but I'm very concerned about it. But anyway, I'm not really so comfortable um, voting on this without those definitions. Can't you tell me what this, is there? Well, never mind. I mean, <laughs> if you can't tell me the definition, I'm trying to make the distinction. Yeah, I mean, it's something I can, I can look up but um, I, I don't have them at hand. Okay, thank you. The intent of the provision is to apply to all commercial hotels, right? I mean, that's as I understand it. Okay, so let's go next to Marco Tamayo. Uh, thank you, Russell. Um, I think this is completely wrong. Our community is, is, is residential completely, and to put this commercial use is going to destroy the fabric of the residential concept that we have. Commercial use, especially hotels, they create a different environment. This is not a community environment. This is people that come in one day or 30 days and they leave our community. We need to have a permanent community. 
and that is, this element is extremely important. And we need to create the pubs and mom stores, which has been part of the tradition of, our, uh, of the Upper East Side. And I think this proposal is wrong. And I absolutely agree with, um, with uh, Rebecca. And thank you so much. Tony, do you want to address that? Um, well, I mean, th this would make it, uh, as of right now, there are many areas in the Upper East Side where a hotel could be built as of right. This would actually create uh, perhaps a more onerous process to siting a hotel in a residential district. Thanks. Okay, next let's go to Barbara Rutter. Uh, that again, Barbara, you, you muted. No, you. I do it. No, you got, you got, you got it. you. You're good. You're I good. do you're it good. too fast. That's my problem. It isn't right, that I had a click, but I'm too fast with it. Uh, I just don't understand what is the problem with the hotels. We have hotels all over and it don't cause a problem. And by the way, I think tourism has already come back. I went to the flower show at Macy's and I had to leave because it was so crowded with people speaking every language you can imagine, obviously tourists. Um, and I went to the Metropolitan Museum and it was filled with tourists. So tourism is coming back, but there's a hotel in 87th Street between 3rd and Lex. There's a hotel on, is it 91st or 92nd Street by, by um, Stanley Isaacs. It, it, I don't understand what the issue is. We have Park Avenue has it, Fifth Avenue has a hotels. What is the issue that we even need something like this? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think the, the purpose of this text is not to say that hotels are inappropriate and we shouldn't be building them. It's just to make sure that uh, the hotels that are constructed um, don't in any way impede, um, you know, pro proper or, or best best land use practices. You know, well, just... isn't that true with everything? The, the, the example of a narrow sidewalk, we shouldn't have anything that narrows sidewalk, whether it's commercial or non-commercial or it's a uh, it's a shelter or whatever else. I mean, there's things that you want safety, but I thought that the idea, of, that, am I missing it, that the understanding that this will limit hotel where hotels can be built or if hotels can be built? That's what it'll do. Yeah. Okay. Um, next, let's go to uh, Rita Popper. About two years ago, I had somebody from Ben Kalos's office do a, a study on homeless people in hotels and motels in New York. And it comes out that 3,900 motel hotel rooms are set aside every year, whether they're used or they're not used um, for homeless families. Now, a family gets a room. It doesn't matter if there are six in a family. It doesn't matter if there are two in a family. And the cost of the room is $200 a week. Why aren't we building affordable housing instead of hotels for people who don't live here when we're not taking care of the people who do live here? There are people who are now homeless because of the pandemic, not because they don't want to work. They're working people. Uh, I will not support this uh, at all for, for the reason that we need affordable housing, not hotels. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to make an observation here. I think there may be some confusion about what the proposal does, uh, just based on some of the comments that I've heard. So um, what as I understand this, and Tony can correct me if I'm wrong, what this proposal does is it takes the current situation where hotels can be built as of right in places where the zoning permits it. And instead of allowing that, it essentially forbids that and requires that a special permit be issued anytime a hotel is going to be built. So before a hotel can be built, instead of saying that a hotel can just be built as of right in an area where the use is permitted, 
It instead requires that there has to be a special permit and the hotel can't be built where it otherwise previously had been possible to build it unless it goes through the process to get a special permit, which includes community board review. That's that it. Okay. Okay, next let's go to Adam Wald. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. I think uh, this application is one of the most misguided applications I've ever seen, uh, both professionally and on the community board. Uh, I don't even understand, as, as Rebecca said, there's no land use rationale for this. The idea that someone who owns a piece of land in Times Square will have to go through a three-year Euler process to build a 200, 250 room hotel is nonsense. It's complete nonsense. We, everyone should, and all, all this does is reward existing hotel owners. And essentially it, it makes new hotel development unfeasible. This is a giveaway to the HTC. I can't believe this, this proposal has made it this far. My understanding was the city planning commission thinks this is an, an, an absurd application based on their questions in the hearing. And I don't really understand why we've even gotten this far. And every, I urge everyone to vote against this. Next, let's go to David Helper. Thank you. Um, let me start by saying that I believe in being able to build as of right under the zoning resolutions. Under the zoning resolution is one of the engines that has driven the New York economy. I also believe in neighborhood review for landmarks and for projects that are not in compliance with zoning regulations. I'd also point out that the uh, examples that were shown, those problems were not that they were hotels, but they were basic zoning problems with respect to whether it's a street wall or a setback well, the width of the sidewalk, that has nothing to do uh, with uh, whether it was a hotel or not. Uh, one of the big issues that has come up is whether this is a payback to unions. Uh, I have no bias where unions are concerned. As an architect, I work with union contractors and non-union contractors appropriate to the project. <clears throat> There's both room for non-union and union contractors and union and non-union hotels. In my judgment and in my experience as an architect who designs hotels, the proposal to require new hotels to go through a few process culminating in city council approval is an economic and a planning mistake. <clears throat> I can tell you that none of my hotel clients are interested in doing hotels in New York City right now. Uh, they do not want to go through this. Hotels do not have the kind of impact of a stadium or an airport. Under this proposed change, would be the only common land use to require city council scrutiny. Right now, hotels are currently as a right in commercial districts, although there is residential and commercial districts. This reflects a mix of uses that was anticipated under the zoning resolution. As pointed out earlier, we have a lot of hotels all over and they don't seem to be problems with respect to the neighbors, business or otherwise. I participated in one of the City planning webinars, and I've seen your presentation previously, uh, and uh, I did that to try and understand the rationale. And as Adam pointed out, I don't think there is a real rationale. Real rationale. A review by the City Planning Commission does not necessarily make for a better design. I've seen the review process improve designs, but also create compromises that destroy the spirit and the best parts of designs. Many of most of the new hotels that are needed are for tourists of modest incomes and business people with limited travel expenses. Developing these hotels is not possible with the costs that will be mandated by this text amendment. Most developers are legitimate piece business people who care about their product and the neighborhood in which it will be situated. It is in their interest to do right by their neighbors and they will not be able to afford the consequences of this text amendment. <coughs> The New York Times pointed out in an article in late April that in areas where hotel construction had been restricted, and you pointed it out also, no new hotels have been built. Developers do not want to undergo the cost of buying the property or optioning the property, paying for the design, paying for the drawings, the renderings, the presentations, the reviews, and so on down the line. 
and find that at the end of the process, they would either not have an approval or they would have an approval if the hotel were to be built by union contractors and operated by union employees. This is very much in the New York Times article. This process may be okay for a four or five star hotel, but not for the two and three star hotels that are needed for the regrowth of tourists in the city. This text amendment is a double-edged sword. It precludes the growth of jobs in construction and hotel operations, and will make it harder for tourists to afford to come to New York. They'll just wind up going into people's homes instead of the hotels. The Times article pointed out that city tourism officials project that the number of visitors in the city may reach 2019 levels by 2025. By then, even in the best case scenario, under the proposed new approval system, uh, the city analysis found that there would be 123,000 hotel room shortage of 5,000 rooms. And quite frankly, even the Times indicated that shortage is probably understated. And uh, Tony, you pointed out that it's, we're gonna be well, well below what we need by 2035. I cannot vote for this tax amendment because it's an economic disincentive, nor is it good planning for the city for the long term. Uh, I urge our board not to approve this. Thank you. Next, let's go to Alita Camp. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm suspicious because as everyone has pointed out, there is no rationale for this. It doesn't make any sense. City planning can't give away permissions to, de to residential developers fast enough to go higher and wider and, high and greater FAR. And yet for something like hotels across the city, there is a special permit requirement that as David clearly pointed out, will impact the ability of the city to come back to its, its necessary tourism levels. I am, against a lot of the development that goes on in the city because it seems irrational, but I just can't fathom the purpose for this. And in itself, that makes me suspicious and unable to support this. So thank you. All right, next let's go to Chuck Warren. Hello, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, uh, I'd like to make a motion to disapprove this uh, action. And if it's seconded, I'd just like to make a couple of very short remarks. Yep, Ed, second it. Okay. I think, it, I think Rebecca Dangor and, and David and Adam very eloquently stated why this makes no sense. And Alita also. There is no real rationale for this. City tourism needs hotels, especially more modest uh, priced hotels. And uh, I, I don't believe that the City Planning Commission is really behind this uh, and, and I won't speculate on all of the other issues, but if something makes no sense, uh, there's, I, don't, I don't believe that we ought to support this, particularly given the present climate and what it's gonna to take to bring tourism fully back to this city. All right, next let's go to Billy Freeland. Uh, thanks. Um, I, I wanted to enter some things from the, the Times article into the record for our discussion and then maybe make a couple points and conclude with some questions for Tony. Um, so in the Times article, a couple things worth our consideration. Um, city budget officials, according to a confidential budget office report uh, prepared in February, said that this proposal could leave the city with insufficient hotel capacity, costing the city $350 million by 2025, and as much as $7 billion by 2035 in lost taxes. Um, the Times also said that we're New York just recovering from the pandemic. Uh, even in the best case scenario under the proposed new system, the city's analysis found that there would be 123,000 hotel rooms, a shortage of more than 5,000 rooms. And then the Times quoted Moses Gates of the Regional Plan Association, who said, uh, no other type of routine development currently gets the kind of scrutiny that Mr. de Blasio is proposing for the hotels. Uh, Gates says hotels would be the only common land use which would always need city council approval to be built no matter what. So this seems kind of extraordinary to me, giving a very uh, unusual uh, zoning amendment uh, for a very particular type of development. And it puts us in an interesting position because I think as a board, we're generally in favor of more community input. But I think we're all right to be a little bit uh, suspicious of why this is happening. And I don't want to 
you know, make any assertions here that seem maybe untoward, but I will just say, trying to be objective, the context, the assumption here is that, you know, Mayor de Blasio has the support, has had the support of the Hotel Trade Council, the hotel union, and their general posture is opposition to new hotel growth, in part because those hotels tend to be staffed with non-union labor. So putting aside the merits of that discussion, that's sort of the context here. So I want to ask um, Tony, I guess maybe just two questions. One is about the effect on our district. Am I correct that we don't have a whole lot of M1, et cetera? It's, it's not just M1. I think this affects M12, M13, uh, M11, et cetera, M16. We don't have much in our district, maybe in the sort of the 90s, uh, where Holmes and Isaacs are around there. Is that right, that this does not have a huge effect on our neighborhood? Or can you walk me through, if I'm mistaken, what our zoning looks like now? Uh, so in terms of the, the M districts that currently have uh, special permit restrictions, you're right. They're, they're, they're very limited within your district. Um, hotels are, you know, uh, allowed in a lot of your district along the commercial avenues. Um, so this would say that along all of those commercial avenues, um, hotels would now have to seek a special permit in order to be built along them. Okay. And then my other question is, there's so much economic uncertainty right now. And some people would argue, based on what I just read, you know, we're going to need a revived hotel industry. This is going to make it a lot harder. Uh, some would say nearly impossible for new hotels to sprout up. Why not wait until 2022, even maybe 2023, to consider such a serious amendment uh, when we have a clearer picture of the economy? Can you just respond to, you know, why it wouldn't make more sense for us to, to wait as a city to even consider something like this? Yeah, so you know, the desire for more site-specific review of hotels has been something that's been uh, in, in discussion in New York City for many years now. Um, and more recently, the administration announced uh, the intention to create a special permit for new hotels citywide. Um, so the department uh, prepared this text amendment to move ahead. But help me understand the timing of, you know, I know that it, it was years and years in the making, but given that we're now in a much more uncertain period economically, why aren't we just waiting to see um, what the need is. Yeah, I mean, I think that's part of the, the purpose of the expanded, uh, you know, vesting provisions uh, is, is to say that hotels that are currently in the pipeline, we're going to allow to move uh, ahead as they would normally. Um, and this would uh, become applicable um, after. Okay, uh, thanks. Um, I support the amendment on the floor disapproving the, uh, the zoning text amendment. All right, let's go to Craig. Thank you. Um, when my building was uninhabitable for a few weeks um, after Sandy, the nearby hotel was really a savior for all the neighbors, my neighbors in my building, who weren't as lucky as I was to have close family a block away that could accommodate us and let us crash for a couple of weeks. I think we as a community need more hotels and I don't understand how this proposal benefits us either as a community or for that matter, any neighborhood across the city. I'm, I'm just confused. Are other communities complaining about rogue hotels or built in violation of zoning or have been overtaken by clusters of hotels that, impacted, that have imp impacted quality of life? It's To me, this seems like a solution for a problem that doesn't really exist. And, Certainly not at a citywide level and certainly not here. So um, I very strongly support our disapproval resolution. All right, let's go to Barbara Chucky. I'm going to be very brief because everything I was going to say has been said already. I just don't understand the reason for this at all. And who's really pushing it? I, I am very suspicious too. And it, it just makes no sense. The zoning laws is what should be used. There's no reason for special permit. It, it just, I wonder where this came from. Who, who is pushing this? I really would like to know that. We're probably not gonna hear, hear about that tonight, but it makes no sense. Special permits, there's no reason for special permits. And the zoning laws should be used and as someone else said, if we have to, in a couple of years, we may need something different, but that's not now. It makes, it's really, I support the motion fully. All right, Ed Hartzog. 
Uh, I'll, I'll beat Barry to it. Uh, call the question. Okay, before uh, we do that, yeah, Barry has seconded. I just want to make a few comments. I mean, my understanding is that the reason for this was that in the prior um, sort of uh, expansion of hotel construction, that there were a number of hotels that were built in some areas. I don't obviously didn't happen in our district, but there were a bunch of hotels that were built in some areas that uh, were done, uh, you know, that the community didn't like. And there was a sort of rush to put up as many hotels pre-pandemic as, uh, as possible. And that that's what prompted this, the community concerns that came out of that. And the fact that a lot of those hotels, um, you know, weren't the kind of hotels that I think people wanted in their, um, in their neighborhood. So that's my understanding of the rationale behind it. I just wanted to put that out there. I, it's not a sort of zoning issue that I think that, you know, the DCP can speak to, but that's the substantive, I think, reason why, um, people wanted it. And so that's, you know, why they want community control essentially over where the hotels would be built. Um, all right, so the question's been called. So let's go to uh, to voting. So I will turn it over to the secretaries. I think I've got this one. Um, so um, this is a motion to disapprove the um, text amendment, zoning text amendment uh, on hotels. Um, Raise your hand if you are voting uh, against the resolution or abstaining or not voting for cause. Uh, first hand up, Russell Squire. Uh, no. All right. Um, Lowell Barton. No. No. Thank you. Um, uh, Ima. Um, Ima. Ima. Thank you. No. Thank you, Ima. Um, I'll give others just a minute. Render it star nine on the phone to raise your hand. Okay, seeing no other hands, the disapproval motion passes. And right. sorry, just a reason to the record, Elizabeth Rose is for the first one. Uh, she was a yes on the first one and a no on the second one. This is during the voting for accessibility. For accessibility. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Let's move to the next item. And uh, this is the planning together task force report. So um, Sharon couldn't be here, who was the uh, co chair along with me of the um, task force. So I'll just give a an overview here and you guys have the resolution. So basically, you know, what we wanted to do was really go through and kind of dig into um, what was really in this uh, legislation. And, and, you know, we began by uh, starting to go through it in some detail. And, and you know, this is laid out in the, um, in the minutes and the minutes don't describe, you know, the full scope of the discussion. But basically, you know, what came through was generally, um, you know, I would say some discomfort with um, a lot of what was in there and, you know, the articulation of general principles in terms of what we would like to see with regard to how planning would be done. And I summarize those and I think they're reflected in the resolution. But basically, there was a real emphasis on having a, you know, bottom up rather than top down approach and you know we had heard the presentation uh, one of the presentations that we heard was from George James who had said that his uh, preferred model in a way was just to have the community boards come up with um, you know planning scenarios for their own districts and ultimately we thought that that was a good idea and you know the sort of to the extent that the countervailing consideration is if you, you know, if you allow the community boards or local community boards essentially to set their own targets for their own districts, you know, how do you, how do you ensure that the city is going to get what it needs? But basically when we sort of dug into that, uh, you know, the thinking was actually, if you really kind of look at, at what we're talking about, and I think to, you know, affordable housing is a good example of this, you know, our district has been calling for more affordable housing for a long time. And so it's not the case that in the absence of, you know, a citywide target or a citywide mandate, you're not going to get affordable housing. In fact, quite the contrary. I think, frankly, if we were able to set our own, you know, targets in that regard, we would probably get more. 
And so the thinking was, you know, community boards really do have a sense on what the needs are in their district and can be relied on in most uh, areas to set the targets that we need for what we need. So this sort of bottom-up uh, community board driven approach is what we opted for. There were a number of other concerns we had, and you can see it in there, you know, in terms of how the director of city planning is uh, chosen and, and things like that. I won't just, I, I won't go through all of them, uh, but basically the view was essentially we, we've we articulated, you know, what our preferred approach would be, and this is what we want. And so the feedback that we want to provide to the city council is that, you know, what we want is a much more locally controlled process, essentially, and, and that's what we want to convey to them. So that's what the resolution is intended to convey. And uh, I do just want to salute um, the folks who participated because it was a slog to go through uh, a lot of the text. And in particular, you know, I noted uh, Michelle and, and um and Taina, in addition to, to Sharon and myself, you know, volunteered to go through particular sections of this and, and present, and that was uh, much appreciated. So uh, with that, I see Michelle has her hand up. So we'll go to Michelle. Yeah, thanks, Russell. Um, and looking at the resolution, I know we talked about it, but I'm, I'm just thinking it might be a good idea to be an additional um, whereas and that's about landmarks in the historic districts. One thing that was notably missing from the suggested uh, resolution was that there was no mention of, of historic districts or landmarks. And I know we discussed it. And um, I'm just wondering as a, a friendly amendment to this resolution, if we can add um, in maintaining consideration of existing landmarks and historic districts. Sure. So it's in, if you look at the resolve clauses, uh, 2D talks about uh, landmarks and, and that's where it was incorporated, but we could also make it a whereas as well. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Tricia. Um, I wanted to thank you both, for, uh, all of you, for the work that you put into this. And I know that I wasn't able to stay for all of the committee meetings on this one, but I wanted to ask about one thing that <clears throat> I, I don't see here is that George had mentioned the that maybe recommending that the community, that the broader community have more opportunities to appeal then at the very end of the process, right now, the only time that we have any ability to, to question what's been given to the community, like the community boards is at the end of the process versus at the beginning, like when targets are set or target goal city or target direct district targets are set. Um, there is no ability right now for us to, to question that. So I'm wondering if, um, if this, if the task force thought about adding another bullet point about um, creating additional points with, uh, through which the community boards uh, or anybody could, uh, could really question or appeal the process. Sure, so I think, um, I think the reason that we didn't include it is because the sort of framework that we outlined in the, in the resolution and the, the conception of the resolution is one where basically the local community board would essentially have, have the final say over what the land use scenario would be in the community district. So from that, you know, to the extent that that's the kind of framework that we're proposing, um, you know, the, the need for community board appeal, you know, that assumes a sort of different framework, which we basically weren't prepared to go with uh, in any event. But, you know, I think to the extent that the proposal does include uh, sort of limited citywide, you know, targets, I'm happy to incorporate that also as a, as a friendly amendment. Thank you. Uh, let's go to Peter Patch. I, I just like to say briefly, uh, I, mean, I support the general concept of sustainability. I support the general concept of rational planning. Uh, my, my concern, rather strong concern with this approach was that it was going to concentrate power in a particular places in the process, uh, in particular with the, the city council and the what one person called the planning czar, and that it will actually reduce the ability of the local community to have influence uh, on the planning process. And, and therefore I thought it would be not in the interest of the community to uh, adopt this approach. Thank you. 
All right, let's go to Billy Freeland. Um, what does it mean to uh, consider public safety as part of the land use scenario? What was the thinking of what that would entail exactly? Well, it's just one area of, um, you know, uh, it's an important aspect of city life, I guess. And so, um, you know, the goal was to be as sort of comprehensive as possible in terms of how things were going to be uh you know, kind of what the future of the districts was and what the planning was going to be. And so to the extent that, uh, you know, citing of different things or what sort of community needs were or whatever are going to relate to public safety, that was, uh, you know, it sort of made sense to include that as well. I guess I, guess I just worry about, um, you know, that cutting against, say, for example, citing homeless shelters. I think we've seen bad faith arguments, not in this board, of course, but throughout the city um, about, you know, not wanting, say, a shelter, safe haven, et cetera, in one's neighborhood um, because of perceived, and I emphasize perceived, uh, public safety implications. And, you know, I, this board very, you know, I think to its, much to its credit supported the safe haven on 91st Street, but I, I just want to flag that as a concern I have about public safety being part of the consideration. And then, I kind of, um, I'm not sure this is enough for me to vote against the resolution, but I disagree with us not having affordable housing as part of the, the citywide targets we should sure urge. I don't think it's a given that a board like ours will um, you know, push for the amount of affordable housing we need because it's one thing for us to say, yes, it's a value. It's another for us to actually get the, you know, into the specifics about how much affordable housing we're gonna get and at what levels of income. Um, so I just think communities should be urged to meet a certain target and that doesn't preclude us from actually figuring out, okay, how are we going to get that? What does that look like in our own community driven land use scenario? But I, I personally think it should be, um, you know, required for communities throughout the city. Thanks. Well, look, I think, um, ultimately, you know, in terms of what we consider, you know, there's no accounting for sort of wrong judgments. And I mean, I think you could take any one of these subject areas and say, ultimately, the community could consider, um, you know, landmarks, or the community could consider um, land use, or consider any of these other topic areas that are incorporated in this and make the wrong judgment about that. And that would be, you know, bad. But I don't think that inherently the, the you know, fact that you would make public safety a consideration uh, that you would consider means that you're going to come to the wrong conclusion about it or, or what have you. And then with affordability, I mean, I just would make the point that's what, you know, we consistently listed as one of our, um, you know, one of our top requests and, and demands essentially in our district needs statement. So uh, let's go next to Marco. Thank you, Russell. Um, I think I found that the, the, the discussion is misguided because the issue right here is not planning because planning, it will take two cycles of five years each. So it will have a deep assessment of each variable that comprehend the comprehensive planning. And that will take five years each. At the term of the five years, expert planning will come with, 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 the, with the issues. Right here, what we discuss is how to make stronger the community participation in the process is not planning. If you said, let me give you the community district needs. The com uh, uh, let me touch exactly specific transportation. Transportation, if you read, they said, we, we may have a face, we may face a serious problem in transportation due to the marine, trans the marine transfer uh, uh, traffic and the new MSK. In reality, when you, you see the, the reality what's happening right now, the marine transport, there is no much impact, even though the projections, I agree, but in reality, that didn't impact at all. But however, the MSK, yes, impact. So what we try to do is we want to impose something that maybe is right, maybe is wrong. Let the professional make the decision. What we have discussed right here is how the community have a good, strong voice in the process. You mentioned very well from the bottom up. And I didn't see in the discussion that, that part. And therefore, I'm going to oppose this, 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 proposal, this uh, motion. Thank you. All right, let's go to Alita.
Thank you. Um, I support the, the resolution, but I'm concerned that we have two city council members that sponsored the, um, the plan. Is that correct, Russell? Yeah. So are there any plans to approach them or because we're not going to have much of a voice if they stand in favor of that? Well, I think, um, you know, the resolution laying out what the, you know, concerns aren't essentially really what the alternative approach we would like to see is, you know, I think that will send a message to them certainly and we'll, you know, send this to them and, um, you know, we can get in contact with them also to, to make sure that they know how we feel about it. I mean, I, I think that, uh, I think the resolution is drafted makes it pretty clear. And I think it says outright that, you know, we don't like the current proposal and, and that's why we're proposing the changes that we're proposing. So I, I think, uh, you know, I see they'll, they'll see this and they'll, they'll get the message. I, I hope so. And that was my only point was that it is a strong resolution and strongly worded, but we need their support on this. And it's a shame, I think, that they've sponsored something of this nature. Thank you. Sure. Let's go to Anthony Cohn. Okay. Um, uh, thank you. I, I think, Russell, uh, you and Sharon and the rest of the uh, task force did a, a did a, a wonderful job, and I, I think it's actually a, a very good resolution outlining, um, well outlining the problems uh, with the uh, planning together proposal as written. Um, uh, I'm uh, my only regret uh, is that. Um, uh, we don't take it further and um, call for a complete rewriting of the zoning resolution, uh, which would solve a lot of the other problems we just spent the last three and a half hours discussing. But um, I certainly will vote for this. And, um, and in fact, I'd like to move we adopt the resolution as written with the minor changes suggested. Okay, so the resolution is on the floor, so you don't have to. Uh, oh, okay. To move it. Then uh, can I call the question? Yes, that you can do. And Billy okay. looks like is uh, seconding, and so with that, we'll just uh, do that. Okay, and i i I think this I think this it's my turn um, as secretary. So uh, all those who are, uh, I guess, Will, you should take down. Oh, thank you. Uh, all those who are voting against the resolution, abstaining or uh, not voting for cause, uh, raise your hands. I'll start with Marco. Uh, no. Okay, uh, Marco votes no. And uh, May, Malik? Abstain. And May is abstaining. Um, I'm just going to give everybody just a little more time. All right. So the motion will pass with a vote of, I think, um, 38 to 1 uh, with one abstention. I think we're down to 40, but I'll check that. Thank you. And the vote on the uh, hotel uh, zoning amendment, um, the disapproval motion was 38 yes and three no. Okay, so that is it for the agenda. There's no old business. Um, yeah, Rebecca. Well, I, I'm sorry to cut you off. I was going to motion to adjourn. Okay, that's in order. Love it. Second. Yes, we got it. All right. Thank you very much, everybody. And happy birthday again, Wilma. Happy birthday, Wilma.